Hey, y'all. Welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is with my friends. And I have here today with me, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh, my gosh. How are we doing today? How is it going? Happy Saturday, everybody. Happy Saturday. (laughs) Woo. And Landon, what are we going to be talking about today? We are talking about our final Harry Potter book stream, uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows. Yes. Oh my God. We're, uh, uh, we're it's here. insane. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. I really, truly can't believe it. Um, it is kind of, it's kind of mind blowing that we, that we yeah. are here. We're on, we're on part two of, uh, of our think we've been Deathly doing Hollows this, stream. I think we've been doing this for a year and a half now. Harry Potter specifically. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's like, we're like, we both are feeling a little nostalgic. We still have, we still have December and we still have Fantastic Beasts coming. But the fact that it's the last Harry Potter book is pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. It feels so fitting to be covering this at the end of the year too. You know, um, uh, Thanksgiving's right around the corner. We we have been working on decorating for Christmas. So we took all of our Halloween stuff down. Uh, we put the tree up, but that's as far as we've gotten so far. Um, we were going to do some more decorating uh, the other day, but, um, you know, we had a little tropical storm that said, uh, no, <laughs> no, you're not. Um, LOL, so, JK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so maybe after stream and maybe a little bit tomorrow also, tomorrow afternoon also, I'll do some more uh Christmas decorating we're gonna do our yard again just like we did for Halloween so I'll be sharing pictures in the discord uh for those of you who don't know I have a rule of no Christmas until after my birthday so I'm being very (laughs) grinchy until then Landon tell everyone what your birthday is what's what's your birthday date so they know when to to tell you my birthday is November 29th it's a Tuesday this year so Mm -hmm. fun yes so Uh, it's the Tuesday after uh, after Thanksgiving Yes, yeah, so Landon always uh, always has like her birthday right around Thanksgiving when we're taking our our Thanksgiving break from stream. And you know what, you guys, if you want to wish her happy birthday, you should definitely get in the Discord because we have a birthday bot in there. So I think Landon, have you have you set up your birthday in there? I don't think you have. I believe so. I mean, you did. Okay. Check. Okay. So it'll 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 check. say it'll remind all all of us when it's uh, Landon's birthday, and we should absolutely flood her with tons of birthday gifts. <laughs> Just applause. That's all I yeah. need. Yeah. Applause. <laughs> applause. So yes, okay. So yes, we are talking about Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Oh my gosh. Um, we did talk about it last week. So if you would like to go back and watch that, you can find it on my YouTube channel. And um and today we're gonna cover some of the segments that we uh that we moved to, of course, the second episode, which is talking about a lot of the different um objects, the magical objects that exist in Deathly Hallows. This is also the episode with our uh, spot the problem segment for this book. So that's gonna be super Super fun. <laughs> it is. It's going to be very fun. <laughs> All right. Let me switch over so you guys can actually see this beautiful deck that Landon made us. Here we go. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Amazing. <gasps> beautiful. Yes. Okay. I'm ready, Landon. I'm ready. Let's We're going to get started as we do at the beginning of every Harry Potter stream by sitting there and saying that this episode of Enter Stage Window is going to contain spoilers for the Harry Potter series and the extended Wizarding World works. Uh, we'll talk about all of the things, especially because this is the seventh and final book, and it kind of is the amalgamation of everything that has happened and the payoff, and we'll talk about whether it uh, fit or not. So if you don't want to be spoiled, uh, go read the books, come back and watch this later. Um, and then also know that there's a lot of things that are wrong with uh, the Harry Potter series and are also dark. So we're going to be talking about past and continual abuse within characters and also the problematic views of JKR, especially the anti-Semitism that exists within this book. Yes. So as always, even though we are big Harry Potter fans, um, we are not uncritical of it. Other, if, if, if there's anything we're ever uncritical of, I'm telling you, we're not going to put it on the podcast. Okay, we're not going to stream about it. So... <laughs> So if you don't so if you don't want to hear about um about negative things in regards to these books, whether that be the content or um or kind of like the overall themes, this is not the stream for you. But if it but if but if you like that sort of thing, stick around. <laughs> All right. And then one more little announcement. Uh we do not agree with or condone any of the awful statements that JK Rowling has made on Twitter over the past couple of years. Um, we stand with the trans community and, um, and we're not interested in turfery in any way, shape or form. 
So, fuck turfs. Yes, fuck <laughs> turfs. So for today, if you would like to support us with donating, subscribing, things like that, that's wonderful. You can do that if you want to. But what we would really prefer is if you take that $5 or whatever it is um, and donate it to the Trevor Project or other nonprofits that support uh, queer and trans youth um, in the U.S., the U.K., really around the world. But because um, because turfery spreads. So, yeah, it that's does. that's for today. All right. We'll get started how we start all of these shows by sitting there and saying, hey, Karen, what was one of your favorite things <laughs> from okay. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows? Yes. OK. Oh, my gosh. So the favorite thing that I would like to talk about this week is um, Dumbledore's brother, Aberforth. OK. The goat fucker. Oh, my God. (laughs) Uh, Yes. However, (laughs) Um, so this character just like when I remember when I read this book for the first time, I had this strong feeling of like, where the fuck has your opinion been all these books? I mean, reading about his account and how he felt what it was like to grow up with Dumbledore. I'm going to tell you, like. This is what changed my mind about Dumbledore's character and made turned me into someone who was basically along for the ride thinking like he's, you know, great and benevolent and super helpful into being like, oh, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait, mm, Dumbledore is actually complicit in Harry's abuse as well. And uh, and the way that this character describes him is what really got me on that train, okay? And I don't think I'm alone because I feel like the fandom also exploded with that opinion around this time too. I might be making yes. that up. I might not. But that's what no, I remember. I <laughs> that's what I remember. And I remember we were all of a sudden like, wait a second. Wait a <laughs> second. It actually is bad that Dumbledore raised Harry for slaughter, okay? Like that is a bad thing actually. And um, because we were all very like empathetic towards Harry, right? Like if you are if you're reading Harry Potter as it's coming out, a big appeal of Harry Potter is the fact that he is an abused child who rises above that and becomes a star and is able to find his voice in this crazy world. And whether you were like directly abused in the way that Harry was or not. Um, being a child and being a teenager is a very lonely and off-putting experience for most people. And so you can identify at least a little bit with what he goes through and imagine like what it might be like if you found your voice and, um, and, and the realization that Dumbledore actually like pushes Harry towards continuing the abuse was just like so mind blowing to me. I love this character. I wish he had been in the books sooner because like he's there. He's at Hogsmeade. The kids could have encountered him before the seventh book, but they don't. Um, But they could have. And I just remember like being remiss that uh, that he didn't come come around in maybe like book four or five or so. Well, they did. They did encounter him. But not they like this. They didn't know it was him. They didn't yeah. know it was Abiforth Dumbledore. Like that is like that is the thing too about Abiforth is like, oh, it's it's the one time I have seen Secret Brother a tr- that has been successfully pulled off. Mm, yeah, actually, and feels <laughs> and feels not like oh what the fuck. I mean, it feels a little what the fucky, but then you're like, man, this character has been hanging around since the fifth book. Uh, and has been mentioned. And maybe JKR just was like, oh, we got to give him a secret brother. Let's choose one of this unnamed NPC. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, I would have done but, that. Like, that sounds yeah, like I would have done that. Yeah, no, yeah. No, yeah, no criticism there. But it was like, oh, no, this checks out. And it was. It, uh, it Abiforth helped us. It was the one opinion of Dumbledore that wasn't benevolent, even in. Dumbledore's active abuse of all the people he abused Mm -hmm. everybody else around him and even in all the secrets and truth telling everyone else praised him said how amazing he was Mm -hmm. and it really did feel like Abiforth was like supposed to be raised as this like unlikable character who's bitter and angry and like not supposed to awaken all of our insights into how terrible Dumbledore is but really we were like this is the one we're gonna listen to (laughs) Like, this is this the man opinion has a that point, matters. Actually, huh. <laughs> maybe Appleforth is right. Mm-hmm. Dumbledore 
is a piece of shit. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, and and this is one of the like really good pieces of character writing. There's a ton. There's 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 J.K. Rowling runs the gamut, okay, and whether she's good at writing a particular character or not good at writing a particular character. But this is one of the side characters in here in Harry Potter that like I am instantly drawn to. I find mm-hmm. them incredibly believable. I find them incredibly um, enriching to the story and the lore of the world. Uh, one of my absolute all-time favorite side characters in Harry Potter is this man right here. Um, yeah. and, and so that's the other reason why I'm like, well, gosh, you know, why didn't he say anything to Harry before Dumbledore died? But then on the other hand, like, this is why it's it's pulled off so well. Because when you hear his take on Dumbledore and how he felt about Dumbledore and the things that he thought about Dumbledore, well, no shit he couldn't have said anything to Harry while Dumbledore was still alive because Dumbledore would have just come and undermined the whole thing. He could not have spoken to Harry about these things until his brother was dead. He couldn't have. He couldn't have. Also, he also wanted so much detachment from Dumbledore mm-hmm. while also living in the literal figure, like the literal shadow of him. He's living mm-hmm. in the town, working in the town right next to Dumbledore's, mm-hmm. where Dumbledore's rule yep. and domain. Yep. And so, so he's the living town in the that's shadow. In, its economy depends on the school. So he is dependent still on Dumbledore, but doesn't want to be. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, he's not going to like sit there and be like, I'm Dumbledore's brother, because he wants as much separation as he can get while also sustaining his life. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure being in the shadow of him is too much for Abbeforth anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not like I have a feeling Dumbledore wouldn't let him go any further. Right. <laughs> like, that's probably why. Abbeforth lives there is because Dumbledore would have had his hands in Abbeforth's life Mm -hmm. and at least here probably less so because he feels because Dumbledore feels Dumbledore feels control over him yeah so probably from Abbeforth's perspective like the strategy is well I'm gonna if I live and work in Hogsmeade and I'm close enough then I prevent some of the um constant oh, i guess they don't have phones i'm about to say the constant phone calls and annoying texts but basically but this is, but this is the nine this is the 90s so in, in wizarding world but anyway wizarding equivalent of the constant phone calls and texts <laughs> out the owls how self spying on him all that uh-huh. Fun stuff. uh-huh all of that all that so, so yeah favorite thing um one of my favorite things from this book Abbeforth, and I would have been remiss if we didn't take a few minutes to talk about him so um so that's why he he goes in my favorite things section for this week love the man i think he's amazing (laughs) so yeah landon what is your favorite thing for this week well for those who may not know me uh you may not know that i am in fact a lore whore i (laughs) love mythology and the gods and the stories that create a world it is Like the stories within stories are my favorite aspects of creating a new world. And so much of Harry Potter exists within the Western Anglo-Saxon sort of aspect of Mm. like living. They celebrate Christmas. There's a little bit of paganism hidden in there, but it's mostly very much celebrating the, the, the familiar holidays. And even, even though there's no mention of worship, there's like a lot of hints towards the modern day religions. It's so very, it, Harry Potter is very Christian. Like, let's just, let's just come Christian. out and say it. It's yes. very Christian. <laughs> um, oh my so, gosh. Hey, Garnet, how's it going? <laughs> so getting an aspect of a like origin story or a hint into the fact that like death exists within the world and belief of wizards and is like a is like a god almost to an extent um and and it has its own separate mythology is fascinating and we get our first story our first and only real story that we hear about uh as far as the tale of the three brothers goes that we get this idea that death is a person who feels emotions uh mostly pride and anger and annoyance and he's a tricker he's almost a trickster Mm -hmm. and he tricks these three brothers into the aspects of death and uh gifts them gifts and objects of power that end up cursing them and leading eventually to their death uh and it's such it's so good and i love it so much and it is everything i love about creating a world and we get finally after seven books we get something and it just makes me 
it makes me fangirl. This is the most excited I've been. Like, I just want to talk about this all the time. <laughs> I, I I think that um that the whole like little lore with the three brothers that we get is great. It's fantastic. Um, you know, it, this is I think this is this is probably a, a reason why we bring up at this point that like Harry Potter is very Christian because this mm-hmm. is a very obviously inspired from the Holy Trinity sort of thing. You know, you've got you've got the three um the three uh godlike people who are bestowed upon with um with you know three sort of powers and um you know it's a little bit more like uh like fantastical and and magical of course in harry potter than it is in the christian religion but it's still it's still quite uh it's quite a christian theme to say like three powerful beings blessed you know blessed by a a god of death Um, yeah you know they're definitely you can definitely tell that the stem is from a christian believe like jkr Mm -hmm. has christian grew up either believing and in christian religion or is currently it seems that that way it seems that way Um, i mean we don't we don't know but our our whole our whole culture is christian whether we want to say that or not i think it's the first time that she purposefully tried to separate the lore of harry potter and the lore of christianity yeah Uh, Because I I think that, like, yes, we can acknowledge the influences of the Holy Trinity and three objects of power and all that that exists within there. Um, But at the end of the day, like, she actively tried to come up with its own lore. Mm -hmm. And I really, I I love that. Yeah. And the lore's good. Like, this is, it's good. It's It's great. It's like a good example of the perfect amalgamation between all of these sorts of ideas that are sort of floating around in the 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 western zeitgeist um and I, it, uh, and she like puts yeah. them together in this like really great way it makes me like because we also get with this not only do we get this hint of it but then we mm-hmm. also get a hint of an afterlife later mm-hmm. in the same book mm-hmm. so like it makes me wish i had so much there had been so much more lore building uh throughout the entire series because even though there was world building there was no real belief system built uh and i wish i had it i wish i knew like is this just a metaphor is the afterlife that harry goes to in that place of purgatory a reminder of the catholic idea of purgatory and um heaven or is it something else like i wish that i had more information about about the lore um and this makes me thirsty for it and it makes me very excited it makes me want to dig into it uh not only where it comes from but the implications of what it means for the wizarding world because when you start having those beliefs that's when you can really start world building and separating what is us and what is the the uh speculative and fictional fantasy version of a place yeah, but on the other hand, I'm kind of glad there's not a Pottermore article on like the oh, wizarding I don't want afterlife a article. because you know no. it would just become it would just become like the wizard shitting themselves situation. Um, it wouldn't be what we wanted. So I'm very I glad that we actually no. don't have that. Um, I but, uh, I but, yeah. want <laughs> I want it to exist within the Harry Potter novels mm. with editors and people who have the foresight of making connections rather than just a fever dream in the middle of the night and JKR <laughs> tweeting something. Yes. I don't want that. <laughs> I want something that is like deeply thought about for years. <laughs> yes. So this is another one of those, like if anyone knows like of some kind of fic on AO3 or headcanon oh. or something that has been written that expands on the idea of uh, the afterlife in the Harry Potter world, please link us. I would love to read it. And th- yeah, well, and then also like there's everything about Master of Death, Harry Potter, uh, mm-hmm. post post Deathly Hollows fix. Mm-hmm. That's one of my favorite tropes because mm-hmm. the Master of Death is also like a, its own. Oh, I can it's talk about one. it forever, but it's we won't because we have so much to talk about. Uh, <laughs> it's a good one. That's a good trope. I guess this is kind of relevant because we're really moving on into the idea of objects of power. Um, because man, you said this in the fourth, when we were doing the fourth book streams and, or third book, and you were like, I just wish there were so many more magical items. Mm-hmm. And guess what? And then we get them. <laughs> we get so many magical items in this book. I, we, for, like, we were talking about, oh, we could do an objects of power, like section. And we realized after we had planned everything that we forgot the Horcruxes. Mm-hmm. Like we were like, oh, there's seven more there. We had talked so long about the ones that we're going to talk about now. 
we didn't even for, we didn't even recognize the horcruxes so we had to put those <laughs> in too <laughs> we had to put those in mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. let's start with the ones that happen very first mm-hmm. uh which is dumbledore's gifts yes yes so the first gift that we get is the tales of beetle the bard so this is uh dumbledore's gift to hermione that he puts into his will and um, and it, it's it's very cute, right? Like he gives the smart one the book, like it's very nice. Um, but it is a children's book, uh, mm-hmm. so it's kind of it, it's kind of fitting that we have this sort of um, Grimm's fairy tales type of book that exists in the Wizarding world. And uh, and I know that there is like a published version of this book, but because Pottermore is what it is, I don't recognize. Anything outside of the actual seven books is actual Harry Potter canon, so whatever. Um, but uh, but I, I wish that in this book there was a maybe an, another cup mentions of like some uh, what the other stories are in this book. Yeah, I think that would be it really goes, cool. It yeah, so it does mention in the novel in the Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows, it does mention the five stories that exist mm-hmm. in there. Mm-hmm. So it's the tale of the three brothers, which is of course a lore tale. Uh, but none of the other ones really have much lore to them. The only other one that kind of does is the Fountain of Fair Fortune, which is very similar to like the Fountain of Youth, uh, the Fountain of the wish of like the Wishing Pot sort of mm-hmm. thing. Then there's the Warlock's Hairy Heart, the Wizard's Hopping Pot, and Babdy Rapidy and her Cackling Stump. Mm-hmm. So two of the three possibly have lore connections. Mm-hmm. And then we and- know Ron loves Babbity Rabbity. And that's yes, really all we, we know, know about Ron that loves one. <laughs> Uh, and we know that there is significant belief, like there is a subset of people who significantly believe in these stories. You know, Phileas Lovegood was one of them. Um, it, it seems to come off as Ron kind of does that these are like children's stories. So they're mm-hmm. not as much lore stories um, as we wish they were. But I think it's because mostly that they're with other children's books. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it is very Grimm's fairy tales. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's really course, cool. It is. And the purpose of Dumbledore gifting this book to Hermione is, of course, smart one gets a book, but also he has his rune notes in the tales of uh, the three brothers. And so he really does have like start the breadcrumbs of trying to get her to collect these items and whether his intention was that this happens all at once at the Great War Or that, like, he just wants to pass on that selfish part of his legacy to, like, sit there and be like, hey, who do I think is worthy of wielding all three of these objects? Hermione seems like the person that could be the master of death. We don't really get confirmation. We don't. And then, and of course, the in-universe reason for this is because Dumbledore just doesn't know how to say what he means to anyone ever. Aberforth shares that with us. Um, Yes. But I like (laughs) to think it's the second one. I like to think... That Dumbledore is like, well, Harry might decide to just die and not come back. That's a thing that could happen. So I can't really pick him. Who's my second choice? The smart one. Yes. The smart one. Good choice. Thank you, self. Well, I also think that there is like a lot of, I I have a feeling Dumbledore, much like J.K. Rowling, sees a lot of himself in Hermione. Yeah. Uh, I know that he has talked about it, that he sees himself in Harry, but I think that like there's this idea of the ambitious, book smart, hardworking defying like having to be the responsible leader was the position that he oh. always put himself in yes and okay. also just to add to that a little bit where i think it is like it is very obvious that dumbledore had clear political ideology and mm-hmm. vision from the time he was very young much like hermione much you know like hermione. so i think that i think that he probably does see a lot of himself in that aspect of her too because harry himself is very apolitical harry's never had a political thought in his in his brain it is ever ever, ever. <laughs> Never ever. ever, but Hermione has political thoughts. Um, it, it, even in the Constantly. way earlier books, you know. Yeah, so I think that there is a like. I think that it like that hint. I like to think that that hint was originally for Hermione, even though narratively, ultimately, it is much more satisfying for Harry to be the master of death. Um, I do think that he was like this is the person who could figure it out and I could bequeath my mission, my personal mission onto this woman. Yeah. And I think that that's very true. Um, and it, I think it, it culminates in the fact that part of Hermione's epilogue is, um, is eventually becoming the minister of magic for a term. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So I agree with that for sure. Yes. So that's our first gift. Our second gift is the Deluminator, which is gifted to Ron. Uh, this is a nice little callback. It's a very open at the close sort of thing. Uh, it's the first cute. Thing that, it's very cute. Uh, the first thing that we see uh, visually in the movies, but we're also explained whenever we meet Dumbledore, is of this uh, object that can take steal the light from things around it. Um, and then also hold light and can produce light later on. So it's this, it's, and we've, we've seen spots and it's been mentioned a line here and there, whenever we're in Dumbledore's office, where these like this little gadget, even though Harry doesn't know what it does is mentioned. So there is like a continuous Easter egg throughout. So the fact that it is opens with Dumbledore having that, and this book opens with it being bequeathed to Ron is very, very cute. Mm -hmm. Um, we then learn later on that this magical ability also has a way to connect to people that you want to find or like like if you're comparing love to light which is a yeah it's a, it's a very metaphor. like it's a very like um your your friends are your light sort of metaphor yes. yeah uh and that, and that this object helps ron uh find his light again when he wants to return back to Harry and Hermione. So there is this like hint what we as the readers are supposed to acknowledge is that there is this hint that Dumbledore knew Ron was going to struggle and eventually Ron was going to leave mm -hmm. and knew that he was going to want to choose to come back. Yes. And that the purpose because there is no other purpose. Yeah. But this moment. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very, it, that's very Kingdom Hearts too, Garnet. Yes, you're absolutely yes. right. It's very Kingdom Hearts. Um, but yeah, and uh, and it's, this is kind of like, um, this is kind of like the hint, hint that like Dumbledore somehow magically like knows everything about everyone and what they think and how they are and, and can predict people very easily, which stay, come back next month when we do the Fantastic Beast stream, we'll break all that down. Uh, mm -hmm. spoilers for that but we're gonna talk uh, about double R a lot in that one <laughs> yes we will but for this particular book i it's his little predicting people power is actually really cute and nice and i i just i love this part it adds to ron's growth we talked about that last dream about how yeah um impressed and satisfying ron's growth is in this particular book so if that interests you go back and watch that vod um because this basically those... ties into all that it's one of the YA tropes that I'm like, man, does it feel real? Does it feel purposeful? No, it feels like a trope, but I'm okay with it because it serves a larger purpose. But I like it. <laughs> I like it. So I'm I'm going to ignore the fact that it like kind of feels very put there mm -hmm. and very purposeful in a way that mm -hmm. Dumbledore wouldn't have any knowledge of it. I'm going to ignore that because it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, exactly. And now Ron has ways to turn off the light without having to like get up. And I love that for him. Like I Me just too. imagine I him mean, I, as like a middle-aged man sitting on the couch, just being like, and it's like the clapper lights. It's like the, it's, okay, so like, Landon, and we're out. <laughs> you have not been to my new house yet. We'll have to get you another visit so that you can see it. But since we have like the smart hookups, we have Alexa, right? And so I can't say it right now because she'll do it. And yeah. Levi will be like, Karen, why are you doing this? But I can literally tell her to turn on certain lights in the house. And um, let me tell you how amazing it is to not have to get back up when you forgot to turn off the lights is literally like <sighs> the best. Oh. I strongly recommend everyone buy an Alexa and some smart bulb next time that the money fairy visits you. This is a purchase you will not regret. I promise. I do love Alexa. Uh, yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, I will have to do that because that is I have the Alexas. I just need the get the smart bulbs. Next Lights. time the money fairy visits you, buy a whole bunch of smart bulbs. You will not regret it. I promise you. Okay, okay, okay. I can do that. <laughs> money fairy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's what I call it. You know, sometimes like uh, you get a night. Somebody gives you like a really nice gift of money, or um, mm -hmm. or something good happens, or you get like a big refund on something. Anyway, that's the money fairy when that happens. <laughs> so yes. I love the Illuminator, right. but there's two more. There's two more gifts. There's that, two more. Uh, the Dumbledore gives them. The next one is the Golden Snitch. So oh. this is this is really good. It's the first snitch that Harry caught in the first books. This is another like oh remember it's that another, stuff from the it's first also, book. It's also so an amazing good. moment in the book because Harry is like like 
Rufus Scrimgeour is wearing a glove, unwraps this golden snitch. We're all just like, what the fuck is happening? Hermione mm-hmm. seems like really tense in this moment. Ron is just like, I got a thing that turns off lights. This is cool. Harry's like, I don't know what the fuck is happening. And you can hear, it's like one of those moments where you can hear the background music. You're like, oh, this is an intense thing. He reaches out and nothing literally happens. Uh, <laughs> it's very it's funny so in the fun. Movie. <laughs> It's another it's another thing of like, oh, connecting the first book to the last book, uh, like really kind of doing that connection. Uh, but then we get this whole it makes me so angry that we get it in this book. We get this whole ass lore dump of like that snitches are like loyal to the first person that touches them and that they imprint on you basically. And and it, I love it personally because I just imagine James Potter wreaking havoc and stealing snitches all the time because <laughs> well, he does like canonically. Layer. It adds this whole <laughs> other layer of like absolute ridiculousness that is Quidditch and why the sport makes no sense and could never why it makes no sense. Work. So it's and just I'm like, like man, you know, the sport is already crazy. Let's just like let's do another scoop of crazy. Yes, if she had been able to drop this a book earlier. Mm. This would have felt so much more satisfying. True. Yeah. It would have felt so much more satisfying. Yeah. Uh, because we as the audience would know why this moment was intense. Some of us would have already figured it out and just been like, Harry, touch it to your mouth the entire time. Uh, but like it would have just and then you wouldn't be like explaining for two paragraphs why this is significant. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It didn't happen, but that's just like the one thing that I'm like, fuck. Anyway, it turns out that uh the golden snitch. Uh, contains the ring that we will later find out is the ring of death or the ring of the ring of uh, what is it when you resurrection it's got the Thank resurrection you. stone yeah the yeah. resurrection stone in it but it's also a ring that held a horcrux yeah um so this it's a object of power within an object of power carrying another object of power it's a three in one mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> it's power all the way down <laughs> it really is the optimal like like optimal uh manipulation tactic Mm -hmm. because harry ends up using it minutes before going into the forest where he has this realization that he the or he he you know he used it over christmas first but he this message of i open at the close is reminiscent of the of the uh words on his parents gravestone uh the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death and it in this like moment in which Harry needs reassurance of, hey, babes, go to the forest and kill yourself, uh, it all comes together to really push him in that direction. Mm-hmm. Uh, because he all of a sudden is able to open up, I open at the close. He whispers that he's about to die. He's given the resurrection stone. He's surrounded by his friends and family who tell him that it won't hurt and to go die. Um, which is oh, terrible. Gut wrenching. Gut wrenching. <laughs> Uh, and that's what ends up being the final push to letting him do this. So this is the ultimate, like, last piece of Dumbledore's abuse, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. is the, is the truly thought out, long planned message, uh, that Harry would need to receive in order to fulfill his duty of dying. Yeah. And, and unlike the, the kind of silly, uh, Behavior prediction of the Deluminator. This one, I actually 100% believe that someone like Dumbledore would um, understand this and be right about it. And yeah. uh, and so, well, yep. <laughs> he had said he had spent six years prepping Harry for this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he had spent six years prepping Harry for that, and mm-hmm. and then a lifetime prior to that, making sure Harry was in the in the presence of people who constantly and consistently abused him, so mm-hmm. that when it came to dying. Harry was fine with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. But there's one more. There's one more gift, and that is the Sword of Gryffindor. So, so these have gotten these gifts have gotten worse. Like we're yes. more and more angry about them. And I have specific reasons to be angry about this one. But I've been talking a lot. So Karen, why don't you share about this one? <laughs> okay. So the Sword of Gryffindor. Um we're going to talk, this is going to come back in the spot, the problems. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to talk just a little bit about this and we're going to put a pin in it. Okay. So, um, so Dumbledore bequeaths the sword of Gryffindor, which he does not own and does not know for sure where it is to these kids who are 17 years old 
You're giving him a magical freaking sword. Uh. <laughs> and then doesn't explore, doesn't explain. And then he doesn't. Yeah. So it's very obvious that he gives the sword because it's one of the few things in the world that can destroy Horcruxes. But he never fucking tells them that this is to destroy Horcruxes, which would not have been hard for him to do. Okay, because they already know that a good way to destroy Horcruxes is with another magical object, such as stabbing or the Basilisk Fang. That's what they do in the second book, right, with the diary. So it would not have been a huge stretch for Dumbledore to explain that, like, strong magical objects can kill other strong magical objects, such as Horcruxes. Like, this is one of those things that he with- where he withholds the information from, from them, and it makes no sense. Not only does it not make no- any sense for his character... It makes no sense for the plot. There's no reason that the kids shouldn't know this. Like they go searching for the sword simply because Dumbledore told them to, and they don't know why. They don't know what it's going to do exactly for the longest time. And there's there's no reason for them not to know. It does not add any intrigue or or, or mystery to the story. It's just annoying. It's just annoying. Especially because he already used the sword of Gryffindor to destroy the ring. Like it's not like he the, he's like, oh, I think this could work. He's already done it, and that was in the sixth book. That was prior to the sixth book starting. So at some point in their lessons, he should have just been like, oh, and also the sword of Gryffindor and other things can destroy them. Like they're so focused on the hunting of Horcruxes that there's no instruction on how to destroy them. And yeah. you're right. It adds nothing to the plot. It doesn't add intensity. It doesn't do anything. And like, so that's frustrating. And then what is equally as frustrating is the fact that this man thinks that he can give an object that doesn't belong to him. Like, it's just purely it's so like just well, cause, a white cause supremacy he, sort of thing happening. Oh, uh, true. So here's the thing. Um, Cause they have to go around the woods wearing the Horcrux, wearing the, the ring, right? Um, and I, I assume that in some original draft, them not knowing that the sword of Gryffindor could be used to destroy Horcruxes was part of the, uh, the plot device to get them to each wear it and have all that great character development that we love. But in reality, they could totally know that the sword could destroy it because it takes them forever to go get the sword from the, the, uh, from Gringotts anyway. So there's no reason uh, for them to not know why the they lake. need the sword. It's the oh, lake. Oh, yeah, the lake. Sorry. In, from the lake. You're right. And then they go do the swap. Anyway. The, so, and the, yeah, the sword is the sword is missing. So that's. Yes. <laughs> so as far as anyone knows, the sword is in Gringotts, but nobody really knows that that's a fake sword at, for most of the book. And then, of course, they find the real sword in the lake and then then they know, OK, well, this is the real one. That one. That's a replicant. OK. And then Grip Hill. But then them right. having the sword is what causes Bellatrix to be paranoid that her vault had been broken it's into. True. And the yeah. cup and the cup is in the vault. So the sword missing is not an issue. Yeah. At all. Like yeah. that's that is the good thing. Mm hmm. It is the idea that they like spend so much time. Like I get angry for Ron because that's a big revelation, right? That's the big thing of being like, oh my God, the sword of Gryffindor can destroy Horcruxes. Like this moment of just pure victory is what really pisses off Ron and mm-hmm. causes him to leave. And I'm like, yeah, I I would too, because that's so mm-hmm. fucking stupid. Mm-hmm. It's so fucking stupid. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, it's just one of those one of those like little nitpick things that I just feel like the story could have been improved by not making this a mystery too. We have enough mysteries. Yeah. They already don't know what or where most of the Horcruxes are. Um, so like I just don't feel like this is necessary and it just it, it just is just annoying. It's just annoying. And the truth is, like at the end of the day, how a, a a piece of media makes you feel is the most important thing in regards to that piece of media. And this plot point makes me feel annoyed. And I think I don't me... think that I'm alone in that. And then I'm also like, Harry got two gifts, <laughs> and I hate that. And it just makes everything uneven. And if we carried out the three, and then the three, and then the seven, like that's so cool. But instead, we did four, three, seven, and I hate that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently your mic is cracking a little bit, Landon. I think I think we're getting a little heated. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. I think it's just because you're loud. It's okay. It's okay. I think it's just because you're loud. Because when I look at the the audio, it's fine. Yeah, it's fixed. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I just okay. I get very excited about this. I'll lean back. 
<laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, the Sword of Gryffindor. Now it does have like a really amazing moment at the end, which is why I chose this particular picture to put up because um, I absolutely love in the movie the shot of uh, of Neville taking the Sword of Gryffindor and cutting Nagini's head off. Like that's one of the coolest well, parts of the movie. I, I freaking love it. Yeah, I, I think it's brilliant the fact that the sword like remains unowned and like we'll talk about we'll talk about the implications of of taking advantage of goblins and and owning things that don't belong to them as wizards in a second but like the idea that you pull the sword from the hat and the sword comes to you in a moment of bravery makes this sword what it is so the idea of owning it fucking sucks (laughs) yeah and so like this moment of neville pulling the sword from this hat and slicing Nagini's head off is both beautiful in the book and also in the movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love that moment. Great moment for Neville. Absolutely great moment, great moment for Neville. Um, yeah, and it's just one of those things that makes me also remiss that we don't get more moments of what's going on at Hogwarts, like well, we talked about last episode. Yeah, and then also to just speak on the sword very quickly, I also love that it is the only founder's thing that did not become a horcrux Mm -hmm. because of the constant movement of it Mm -hmm. because of it calling to the need of bravery and those Mm -hmm. who are in need of it i think that that is something like that that just speaks to the gryffindorness of it um and also like makes it make sense to why riddle never found it and wasn't able to imbue it with a horcrux yeah, because you know he would have if he had. He he tried. He was trying to find it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wanted all four founder stuff. And the fact that this was the only one that eluded them is awesome. And I think that, like, I wish we had gotten into, I wish there was more lore about the, uh, about the other objects because we see them. And we can talk about this. When, let's save that for when we're talking about Horcruxes. I'm putting yeah, him we'll in save that, that for that slide. Talk about. I got some stuff to say about our, our Ravenclaw about ladies that. one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So. so yeah, Sword of Gryffindor, um, gifted, gifted to the the trio. Put a pin in that for the spot the problem section. We're gonna we're gonna circle back. We're gonna circle uh, back. But this is Dumbledore's gifts, and uh, they're the first objects that we see that we're opening up the opening up the book with. Mm-hmm. And one gift leads to another, and that's after they read the tales of Beetle the Bard. They mm-hmm. discover the Deathly Hollows. Yes, yes. So we find out that the Invisibility Cloak, one of the Deathly Hollows, uh, they have actually had all the way since the first book, and that no other Invisibility Cloak that exists in the Wizarding World is actually a true Invisibility Cloak the way that Harry's is. So mm-hmm. that's pretty astounding. Like we learned this from um, Xenophilius, I think, is is who yep. explains this, um, that other Invisibility Cloaks do not actually make you fully invisible the way that this one does and they don't last long like they don't last forever the way that this one does and and we know that this cloak has existed um at least for a couple of generations when when harry gets it because his father had it before him but uh but now it's implied that it's existed for perhaps hundreds of years if not longer um and uh, and still freaking works just as good as ever uh they never really have like a malfunctioning invisibility cloak part of the plot like that just doesn't really happen in harry potter although it seems kind of like an, an obvious trope that you could have if you wanted to but they never do it well here's why i think there's a good lore I, reason yeah i think that the only the only other time that has been mentioned is when they all got too big to fit under it that their yeah. feet were spotted yeah uh but that that was <laughs> i mean i think that that's just just fantastic like yeah well that's like, just because the cloak size is the cloak size is like one of it's those for one person um, yeah it's for <laughs> it's for one person it's kind of like um you know a uh, cloak fits most adult s- size you know that's the only reason that happens um but i thought i think that that's the only time like there's been a malfunction but yes mm-hmm. no um and we learn and it's it is it's one of those objects too where it's like this has it been in harry's hands the whole time and it is this like the fact that it connected not only to his father, but now it connects him to the story. And there's like so much implication of family and heritage attached to it, which is something that Harry has always been searching for, uh, really high is highlighted because mm-hmm. of the story. And um, yeah, and it's it's like that cool thing of like, oh, this is this is a really big deal to own this thing. And of course, because they've hold, held it and they have it. 
there is now like that seed is planted that these objects might be real. Yeah. Yeah. Very, it's um, very cool. And it's like, oh, well, if we have one, then the others probably exist too. And like, yeah. that so, makes sense. I would believe that. And so for the, for the story purposes, for those of you who haven't read the tale of three brothers recently, uh, the cloak is used for the youngest brother who uh, used to hide from death his entire life, handed it off to his youngest or his eldest child and greeted death like a friend. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was like the really, the true way to die uh, to escape death was to live his life without trying to seek glory or anything like that, just to take, you know, take death as it was and take it when it's ready for you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they talk about in the in the books that um, the the Percival brothers, who is in, who is probably the three brothers that are mentioned in the story, um, have like uh, they're like ancestors of a lot of different wizarding families. And because mm-hmm. the cloak is given from the youngest brother to his you know eldest and passed down like that, it's implied that these are ancestors of the Potters as well since we know james eventually ends up with the cloak we don't know that for sure but it's heavily implied and we do and we also have the hint that the percival ignatius percival who is the person who with the cloak the youngest was also buried in godrick's hollow uh and that the potter family uh had a home in godrick's hollow for as long as the dumbledore family did Mm -hmm. or even longer so like the there is that connection there too um so yeah that's a that's a fun little a little thing. Yep. Uh, and then the resurrection stone. This one's quite unique because out of the three objects, it's the only one that doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So in reality, there is no such thing as true resurrection where you can just have a stone that can resurrect anybody at any time. Um, there is no such power, right? Um, however... It does help you communicate with dead loved ones. Um, it, it may be perhaps through your imagination. It's a little unclear, but I like to think it's real. I like to think it's real. I think mm-hmm. those are really their ghosts speaking with the way that it's portrayed in the book. And then, of course, um, because Harry is in possession of the ring, I believe that this is why he was able to choose if he was really ready to die or not. Mm-hmm. Right now, I think that this is not the case. The, the ring doesn't function in such a way that if Harry had chosen like, no, I think it's time to die. I don't think I need to go back. I think everybody they've got it. They're fine. They don't need me. Like I served my purpose. If he had decided that, I don't think like Ron would have been able to pick up the ring and be like, you know, Accio Harry resurrect. Like, I don't no. think that that's, that that's a thing. Well, um, I- so it, it doesn't quite function literally in the way that the other objects function. Like, literally the way you would imagine so the way that is portrayed in the story again big fan of the tale of the three brothers uh (laughs) is that the the middle the middle brother asked to see his wife again and to bring her back to him so death twisted that as to see your wife again and called it the stone of resurrection Mm -hmm. even though it's not resurrecting her so he takes her there's like this idea that a soul exists uh in the story that takes their soul and from whatever happens that soul is removed from whatever afterlife exists so there every wizard we know from wizard lore has a choice of to become a ghost or to move on uh and so uh if you become a ghost your soul doesn't move on if you move on you can't become a ghost Mm -hmm. uh so what this does is it takes the soul without that choice it takes the the choice from the person who has died and brings them back to earth for only the person to see them Mm -hmm. uh and they're not supposed to be there they're miserable they've chosen to move on and died so it really like teaches this lesson of of letting go but because you're constantly haunted by the things that are causing you grief you also can't move on so it eventually causes the middle brother to kill himself yeah and um, um and the thing is is like eh, so voldemort obviously is somebody that believes in the the tale of the three brothers being literal objects obviously and and yet <laughs> and yet he's hunting for the resurrection stone it's like bra what you think it's gonna do friend what you think it's gonna do <laughs> well but like that's the thing that i found interesting with all of this is that he Voldemort believes that they're real he doesn't care about becoming the master of death he cared about having the power to defy death 
So the resurrection stone was never his goal. In fact, he turned it into something else. He Mm -hmm. had it in his hand and didn't give a shit about it. He turned it into a horcrux Mm -hmm. uh, because he doesn't care about bringing other people back. Mm -hmm. He just wants to be unbeatable because if he can be unbeatable then and he's already cure he's already created these objects of immortality if he can be not beaten and also have immortality because of his horcruxes he's 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 already the master of death at that point yes um and i think that that is something that is incredibly interesting is that to harry i think i think that the cloak is incredibly important to harry for the sentimentality reasons but I think to Harry's story, if Harry didn't, I know he cho- chose the cloak when they're all like, we'll choose one. Mm-hmm. Um, I-, I think Harry honestly would have chosen the ring because he yeah. wants to bring, I mean, it's the same thing that drew him to the mirror every night was bringing yeah. back and being able to connect with his family uh, and all the people that he loved. So there's really like a Harkinson, like a, a, a reliving of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's exactly what it is. It's a it's um it's a call back to the mirror of Erised scene in the first book. Yeah. 100%. Did Harry sorry, I'm trying to think. Did Harry choose the invisibility cloak or did Hermione? Um I can't I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't remember. remember. I have to Google it. I'll, yeah, it doesn't it's fine. I, I do know that like, they have a conversation about like how, mm-hmm. you know, everyone is like, Oh, bad people choose the wand, but actually think about all the things you Ron can do with chose it. The wand. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> well, they have that I part think- of the conversation. There was a, I think there's a question where I was like, Xenophilus would be like, which one would you choose? And they yeah. all three said different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was like, oh, that beautiful moment. But yeah, that ring, the ring of resignate, the resurrection is, or the stone of resurrection is a fascinating thing because from there, it was all the people who were like trapped in their grief. And so its history is just as bloody as the wand. It really is. Uh, uh, but it's by the their own rap. hand. Yes. But although- because it's by their own hand. It's suicide and grief rather than a thirst for power. Yes. Yes, exactly. So let's talk about the wand that doesn't make any fucking sense. So, yes. Okay. So this wand, this wand is supposed to be the most powerful wand. Um, Pretty much everybody who's ever studied wands kind of believes it exists, but the general public seems to have no real specific opinion on it. Um, uh, So yeah, out of all three objects, this is the one that has the most kind of uh, believers, right? That there is there of all the wands in the world, there is one that's more powerful than all of the others, which kind of makes sense. If you really studied wands, like why wouldn't you a- a- imagine in this world where hierarchy is considered a good thing that there isn't a most powerful wand? Of course you would think that that's true. Right. Um, so the wand is the most powerful, but just like all wands, it still recognizes um, a sort of relationship where there is a a master of it just like everyone you say the wand chooses the wizard and essentially we get a better explanation in this book of what that really means is that the wands form relationships with wizards and have opinions about who they belong to right like a dog does or something (laughs) and uh, wands are pets yeah wands are your pets and so basically what that means is they're able to do this like crazy little switcheroo where the wand doesn't behave properly for Voldemort because it's basically like you ain't my owner bitch take me home <laughs> thanks which for is... thanks for the kibble but I'd like to go home now <laughs> so which is great in theory except there is no definition at all of how to conquer a wand mm-hmm. so this is like the most confusing thing ever. Traditionally, most people believe you have to kill the owner and then you possess the wand. Yeah. Um, Which we know that method what, works, by the way. We know that method works and we know that Voldemort is under that control mm-hmm. or under that idea. Yeah. But <laughs> Dumbledore and Snape colluded for Dumbledore to, or for Snape to kill Dumbledore. Yeah. So never truly disarmed him or mastered him or beat him mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so dumbledore so, yeah so snape killing dumbledore according to the wand even though it killed him is not true conquering him yeah. what like truly defeated him was being uh disarmed by draco malfoy 
Yeah, because the wand was like, oh, you're the one that actually defeated him because like it's kind of like, you know, okay, like if, if an old person is in the hospital and um and and they everybody decides like, okay, it's it's time to let them go, the doctor pulls the plug. Like, did the doctor really kill them or con- like no that was like a collective decision which between the doctor and like that's that's not so anyway the book is basically saying that the collective decision that dumbledore and snape make doesn't count because snape snape's allowed to do this which is fine right okay i can get behind that i can get behind that mm-hmm. and so draco was not a part of that so disarming him could shift control fine but then we have a lot of liability we're opening up with disarming disarming all of a sudden means defeating and so anytime like i'm thinking like when uh snape defeated and disarmed lockhart all of a sudden that is but it makes sense still dumbledore died the last person to defeat him gets the wand Mm -hmm. fine perfectly fine draco malfoy is the owner of the elder wand at this point he doesn't know it he has his own wand he has his own wand and harry doesn't disarm him magically, doesn't do anything magically, grabs a handful of wands from Draco's hand. Draco lets him do it. And Harry is now the master of the Elder Wand. Draco's still alive, so it's not like he has a chance to not bring anything back, right? Like, he, like he's still alive and kicking, but that means, according to the wand... Harry defeated him? Yeah, it's almost as if, like, in reality, the wands having their own opinions, it doesn't have, like, a hard and fast set of rules, but they try to they try to give you a hard and fast set of rules to where, like, at the end of the day, when you actually read the text and look at what happens, the truth is, is that it's kind of just up to the wand and they just make a decision. And, and they can explain to you why they made their own particular decision. But collectively, wands just kind of do what they want. <laughs> Like that's which that's the that's that's the reality when you read the text, but I don't think that's which, what we're supposed to believe. Which, which I can get down behind, but a that's not what it's being presented at. Yeah, and b this is supposed to be the biggest fucking plot twist in Harry Potter history. Yeah, and it feels so lazy. Mm-hmm. So lazy. It feels really the most- lazy lazy in fact <laughs> just sit mm-hmm. there and just be like no oh, the wand works for harry it doesn't work for Voldemort, and yeah. now we got to figure out why yeah and then in addition to that being a little bit silly in the oh, yeah. movie they change the way that the Voldemort. wand is removed from the plot completely with harry just breaking it um did you know you can just break wands which you can just do it and then that destroys everything which doesn't make any sense because no. when you when you break wands, at least as far as we know at this point, is that you can cast various spells to repel them unless they've been broken by some kind of magical means. Then then maybe it's a little bit trickier, right? Or or not possible. But liter- Harry just goes, <coughs> which oh, as far as we fuck? know shouldn't do anything. Why the fuck? We yeah, Harry, do yeah, Hagrid's wand snapped in half. He still fucking uses it. Yeah, he just put it inside of an umbrella so that it was still all together, and then it works. That's so dangerous, Harry. So irresponsible. Yeah, super irresponsible. Like, and also, like, I understand it was for a visual effect in the movie. That's why they chose it, is because there's something much more visual about that. What Harry chooses to do in the book is, like, go back to the elm tree, or the, the el- yeah, I think it was an elm tree or whatever, that uh, Death had originally taken the branch from, and, like, try to, like, bury it there so that it would remain hidden and unfound for the rest of time which then also matched the the resurrection stone which was lost in the forest so it was the it was the idea that these two objects of power were lost at separate entities of the world and harry would continue passing down the invisibility cloak like there's something poetic about this he just fucking snaps the wand in half in the movie yeah and i know I that it wouldn't so it wouldn't be as visually appealing and it would take longer to portray him burying the wand but snapping it in half like unless you're just not paying attention to how wands work so far which we're supposed to be paying attention to in this book because a huge part of it was finding the elder wand um it just it's just very like what 
So instead of being like, oh, what a great visual of of watching him break it and throw it, like this is very cool looking, you're just left thinking like, but wait a second. Someone's going (laughs) to find that shit. Someone's going to find that shit. Disarm Harry randomly. Just grab a wand from his hand. Disarm him. And then they're going to be the master of death. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I hate it. I hate it so much. Yeah. So such a cool concept ruined by trying to logic it out when it shouldn't be logic out. Like, yeah, it's such a cool concept, but there should have been a hard fast rule. There should have been. It should have been the person who killed him. Yeah. Yeah. Which so means this, this object Draco just... Malfoy should have died. Like, like at the end or disarmed him in fin- the final disarm, right? So mm. Draco Malfoy should have died. Like that's at the end of the day what should have happened. That would have fixed everything. It would have. And that's me but saying it. It would have, but I think it would have really destroyed the point of his character. The point of his I character know. was to show that Slytherins can be redeemed as well. Like that was the whole that's the whole thesis of Draco Malfoy. So I they couldn't know. have done that. They couldn't have done that. But we you know what they could, but that's why I think like what they really should have done and said, like, you know, at the end of the day, it's up to the wand and the wands have opinions. And then they could have had a situation where like Draco gave the wand away. It should have well, that should have also been like because that's like what people in the fandom su- suspect happened is that yes. Draco's willingness to give it the wand of relinquishing control. But then what should have happened is that from that point on, Draco should have been loyal to Harry, yeah, because yeah. Le- Draco then going back and still fighting Harry, yeah, makes no sense, yeah, because he's already given up his loyalty to totally Harry. totally agree, totally agree, yeah, yep. But that's why I like to imagine that wands. Are like dogs and have like owner type that. of relationships <laughs> with humans. But Landon, it makes so much more I sense and it's that. so much more interesting. <laughs> no, because okay, fine. I'd be here for it if you actually nurtured them throughout the seventh book. Yeah, I seven understand. books. I understand. It happening in the last quarter of the se- of the seventh book. Yeah, when we're more than a million words in at this point. Yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, no. this is definitely like me going back and rewriting. And it's like, if we were to rewrite Harry Potter from scratch from the beginning, I mean, this is definitely this one is, of those type of ideas. This is the jump the shark moment for me. Yeah. The minute that <laughs> wands became more like dogs than actual logical magic is the moment that I was like, we jumped it. We did the thing. Mm. <laughs> anyway, let's yes. talk about Horcruxes. Okay. All right. Horcruxes, you guys. So quickly there, name there all are, seven. <laughs> oh my god. There's the there's the book, there's mm-hmm. the ring, there's the mm-hmm. cup, there's the mm-hmm. diadem, there's mm-hmm. Nagini, there's mm-hmm. the there's the locket, and then there's mm-hmm. Harry. That's seven, mm-hmm. right? That's Eight. all of them? That's seven. That's all of them. Okay. I did it. Good for you. Yes. I passed the Harry Potter test, you guys. <laughs> Gold star for me. So many objects. Gold star. Okay, so I want I, we have talked about the Horcruxes before, so I don't want to belabor them yes. too much. But the whole reason this slide exists is because we have to acknowledge them. And also, I just want to talk about how much I love that the diadem gives us this beautiful backstory for the Grey yes. Lady and the Bloody Baron. And oh my God, I, I I like rereading this book. Like I remembered how much I loved that. And um, it's on my to-do list to go on AO3 and see if anybody has written Bloody Baron and Grey Lady fic. Um, I feel like that has to exist. In fact, I'm going to I'm gonna look it up right now and see if anybody has that. Oh, I'm AO3. sure. It's got to be. It's got to be, right? Because it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful and it's so tropey. And I just freaking love it. I think the diadem is one of the coolest objects. Um, no notes. Honestly, like I think it's perfect. And I wouldn't change a single thing about its okay. story. This is what I want to change, though, because I can't remember directly if this existed. But, okay. For the four objects of the founders themselves, Mm. I wish we had a little bit more on. Because Mm -hmm. we have Gryffindor, which has this cool power of showing up when a person needs that extra boost to be brave. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A weapon to help fight the battles when being brave and Mm -hmm. asking for help and having the bravery to do that. Right? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I wish we knew what the other three's objects powers were because it's like this idea of like being like, oh, Gryffindor has a magic sword, but like, you know, well, I, the I locket think, is smart. I think the rumors about what the diadem does are true. I think I think the diadem would help you with knowledge and then the students okay. interpret that as helping so, with school. Like I think that's I think that rumor about it is legit true. Okay. I think the so, only object we really don't know anything about is the cup. Well, and also the locket. 
That's true. We really don't know much about the locket. So I anyway, there's the, I... anyway there's a total of three fix out of the three. One of them looks like it's <gasps> actually it? what I'm looking for. Yeah, but oh. there's only three. There's only three with the tag, and I. But I'm looking at the descriptions. I think only one of them is actually what I'm looking for. Anyway, I'm gonna read this. I'm gonna read this this okay. weekend. I can't there's wait. It's a, 945 a words. It, yeah, it's 945 it's like words. So it's it's a little bit long, but not super long. Um, it's got 21 Nine. kudos. I will not. You're like, it's 943 words. And I'm like, I won't read anything less than 2,000. <laughs> oh, my God, Landy. I, it might be good. We don't know. Anyway. I'll read it. Long, I don't think. I'll, I'll gladly read it. But 934 words, that's that's three pages. It's called Just Fade Away by that's, Tamari. It's not so even three we'll pages. See. That's two, we'll see if that's it's two any pages. Good. We'll see if it's any good. I'll take a look at it. Anyway. Um, But yeah, Go so ahead. I agree. I think that like if the, if the diadem was like – a helm of knowledge sort of D D reference yeah of like that you get i think it is basically intelligent awesome um it's an I int bonus it gives you an int bonus it gives you it gives you a, yeah it's a it's a plus two to your intelligence yeah score here we go okay we're back nothing, guys so sorry about nothing that nothing happened i think Lynn's <laughs> internet's okay now okay go anyway, for it tell us i had the script idea that like the cup is like a cup of nourishment that it like feeds you and provides you like with water or whatever you need because the food and Hufflepuff is like such a connecting thing right yeah. and then that's like a help ah, sorry my computer is now freaking out there, there we, we go. go um it's such a helpful thing I want to know what Slytherins would be I haven't thought of that yet but that is what I thought of and I'm like those are the two things that I'm like I'm bummed we didn't get to see out of these important objects that exist those are obviously like unique because they were important prior and i wish there had been built-in lore about those things mm -hmm. yeah i feel like it would be it would be really good um they could make really good like D, &D type objects i agree i'm not sure what the lock it would be probably something to do with secrets or lying or bluffing or something like that um would be i was really gonna cool be like a it. it's a charisma boost yeah yeah like a charisma boost it's that a would be really like, cool Listen, a con modifier, a strength modifier, an intelligence modifier, and a charisma modifier. Yes. I am queen. I love this. I'm here for it. <laughs> and then yes. the ring is a is a is a uh, wisdom modifier. There we go. Well, of course it is. Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, we've talked about the Horcruxes a lot, but it is important to mention that they are objects of power, yep. that they obviously rule both the sixth and the seventh book. The purpose of them is finding them and destroying them. Um, I do love that we did find out, like like we said earlier, we could have found this out in the sixth book, but like finding out that certain, it's harder to kill them and harder to destroy them. Uh, mm -hmm. and that there's only certain things that do that, I think is fascinating mm -hmm. and fantastic. Yeah. Like the act of putting the soul in the object means that you have to, you have to do special things to kill it now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so like the idea of it being basilisk venom, um, it being friendly fire, uh, I think those are really the only two ways that we see yeah. it destroyed. Other, uh, the sword, of course, the sword of Griffin. Well, the, but the sword is because it because it killed the basilisk. That's true. It's now yeah. imbued with basilisk poison. Yeah. So, um, I think that that's really cool. Yeah, those are the two main ways that they that they destroy Horcruxes. I think you're right. Yeah. Well, and then Avada Kedavra. Yeah, of course. Well, of course. That, des that But that's kind Harry. of the obvious one, right? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> yes. Um, and also Harry being a Horcrux is a beautiful turn to all of it yeah i do like that part so yeah horcruxes if you want to hear more um go back and watch some previous vods we have a whole we have one episode where we break down all the horcruxes i use the same picture can't remember which book that was that we talked about that but i know it happened so you can go find that in the vods all we'll right and next we would like to take just a little bit of a break with you guys and talk to you about this episode's sponsor audible landon tell everybody about audible audible is your friendly neighborhood um audiobook reader uh basically it's uh you can go to www.audibletrial.com slash interstage window and you can get a free audiobook it's a monthly subscription so you get a free book every single month with your subscription of course uh it really helps out the show here and it also is just like a great way to consume books because i've been having to tell i said this last week but i've been having to tell a lot of people of this recently but like reading and listening to an audiobook is still reading 
Like you're still consuming a story. You're still reading a book, whether you're actually physically reading it with your eyes or letting the words sink in and auditory listening to it. It's the same thing. Yep. It's still so, prose. You're still consuming prose. And if you yeah. sign up for Audible and um, and download some of the, the books that we talk about on the show, you can kind of read along with us. So that's yes, too. Yes. We have plenty of books coming next year. So be sure to do that. And what is our recommendation, our, our Audible recommendation for today, Landon? All right. I'm going to uh, do one that I have done once before, but it's really good because the sequel just came out and I'm getting it this week. Let me see if I can pull Ooh. up the cover. Uh, well, let me pull up the cover. So yeah, as you guys know that um, that are watchers of the show, uh, almost every book that I read is an audiobook nowadays. I simply don't have time to read, read books, and I'm very slow at it. Oh, oh, tell us, this tell is, us about this. This is Gilded by Marissa Meyer, uh, who is a, I recommended her book multiple times, but yes. Gilded is a really fantastic book. Uh, it is a fae retelling of Rumpelstiltskin. Um, mm-hmm. It also involves a lot of lore, a lot of fun things. Uh, my absolute favorite thing is the opening line. And if Karen will give me a second, do you mind yeah, if yeah, I yeah. read? Regale us. Uh, so... I want to be, um, the first thing you ought to know is that this wasn't my father's fault. Not the bad luck, not the lies, certainly not the curse. I know some will try to blame him, but he had very little to do with it. And I want it to be clear that it wasn't entirely my fault either. Not the bad luck, not the lies, certainly not the curse. Well, maybe some of the lies. Oh, Such a good starter. Um fantastic start to the book uh marissa meyer retells uh fairy tales in new and creative ways and this is a fae story retelling and it is fantastic uh and the newest book just released on monday it is coming tomorrow in my amazon i am very excited about it uh (laughs) so that i can read the next one so i'm sure that that'll be an audible recommendation coming up (laughs) Very cool. Oh, I can't wait to hear if you liked it. Will do. Uh, yes. It's been a really big reading week. I think I'm up to 10 books this week. Wow. So, fun fact, My God, girl. Most of them are romances. They're That's just, okay. They're like, just like potato chip romances. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> That's still reading. That's still reading. It's still reading. That's so right. Yes. If listening to an audiobook is reading, so is reading romances. <laughs> That's right. So audibletrial.com slash interstage window. You can do the 30-day free trial there and you help out the show. No obligations. You can do just the 30-day free trial if you want to. Although I personally um, am actually an advocate of this service. So I would recommend continuing it, but you don't have to. If you just want to do it to support us, that's fine too. Yes. All right. Shall we talk about it? Yes. Okay. Oh, Mm, okay oh. so there's a, there's a lot of death in this book a lot a, a lot there's a fun little fandom theory uh that comes along and i really love it uh one of my favorite dedications that jkr has ever written is actually in this book and it's a seven part dedication and it lists her daughters and some family members and some and uh some editors and stuff like that and then it says uh, and for those, for you, who stuck through Harry through the, the very end. So there are eight dedications. There are eight Horcruxes. And there are eight deaths. Uh, which feels very cool. Yeah. So um, we've got, we've got and- Hedwig. <laughs> we've got Moody. We've got Peter Pettigrew. We've got Dobby. We've got Fred. We've got Remus and Tonks. And Colin Creedy. Yeah, and Colin Creedy. Which I know it like, seems like a small one, but. Um, it's a small one, yeah. But really important deaths because they all mean something. And there's like this idea around fandom that they're all of the deaths that JKR had to do for this book. Uh, like to, to for her horcruxes. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and. They all mean something. They all stand for something and have a metaphorical meaning. Meaning, And I think that that's something that's really interesting because we haven't seen a lot of death. Uh, we, we typically get one death per book from the fourth book, Cedric Diggory, Sirius Black, uh, and then Dumbledore. Mm-hmm. But in this one, we get seven. And they 
because there's a war happening, but also they all have that implication of meaning. So Hedwig dies at the very beginning. She's the first death of the book. Yeah. And that is to represent Harry's innocence. Harry. And this, one, this one in particular to me, um, it's very impactful. But then I'm almost, because there's so many deaths in this book, this one makes me the the saddest because we don't get to spend a lot of time with it. So I, I always, every time I'm reading this, I always feel like I didn't get a chance to mourn Hedwig because we move so fast away from her death to the other deaths that happen. Yeah, it's it's within the same chapter. And also she's an owl. And, and even though she's like the constant, consistent companion, companion Harry has, there's a lot of logic to her death that mm-hmm. he couldn't have a snowy owl while camping. Like yeah. Hedwig immediately complicates a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, but they, they conveniently forget about Crookshanks, as you notice, they, you know? So, yes. I mean, that's what would have happened to Hedwig if, if she had not died. Um, But there is this like, this consistent idea of, of Harry in this moment, he had a friend through the loneliness, who was also trapped, who was also locked in her, her cage, who had to suffer through summers at the Dursleys and then feel the freedom of Hogwarts, uh, who is left behind and died in the escape chase to save Harry's life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is the moment that even though all of it has felt real prior to this, this is the moment for Harry where like he loses that one thing. He lost Sirius, but that was before the war started, and he went through so much trauma after that. Here, it's suddenly, now is the fight, and it is serious. And Moody does that same thing, except he does it for everybody. Uh, Hedwig sets the tone for Harry. Moody sets the tone for everyone in the Order and all of its readers. And his death is very tragic, but because he dies basically at the same time as Hedwig, we really spend a lot more time focusing on his death because everybody else is like, oh, that's really sad that you lost your pet. But like, what the fuck else are they supposed to say? Like, it's his pet. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everybody else is like really caught up in the other things. They don't have time to to help Harry with losing his his childhood pet, you know? So we kind of like brush Hedwig away to focus on Moody's death instead. Well, and it really marks, Moody really marks the beginning of the war. Yeah. Because Harry is spending summers with the Dursleys, they have this long drawn out goodbye. Like there is certainly ramifications of the ramming of like coming up to a war, but mm-hmm. Harry doesn't know any of the insides outs that are happening mm-hmm. in the ministry. He doesn't understand the political things that are at play. He doesn't see the changes in administration. And that not, doesn't really happen until after the wedding specifically. So when Moody dies, it's, you know, Dumbledore was the preset of war is coming. Moody is the war is here. Also, they don't get his body back. Mm-mm. And he's that's something gone. that we, he's just gone until we see at the ministry that they're using his magical, like Umbridge is using his magical eye to spy on people, to have it on her door. The I am always watching you sort of constant vigilance, but twisted and turned in a sick, perverted sort of way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it it really is like this gut-wrenching sort of thing of like, oh, here is the emotional death, but here is the plot death. Like this mm-hmm. death is for plot. And it is because, you know, with Dumbledore dead, you could see Moody easily slip into that mentorship role, but mm-hmm. Harry can't have a mentor right now. So we have to get rid of no. Moody. We have to. Um, And then the wedding happens. They run away. There's a long gap between deaths. Yeah. Um, There's an entire war basically fought where Harry, Ron, and Hermione are isolated and on their own. And they meet people who we will later learn have died um ted tonks being a big one but uh they don't they have death as a constant fear hanging over them as a possibility yeah but they don't face it uh Mm -hmm. they don't face it at all um until they escape malfoy or until they're in malfoy manor yeah and they and they get captured by the snatchers and they go and they confront um several (laughs) excuse me, of the Death Eaters. And that's where we're faced with the deaths of um, Peter Pettigrew and Dobby. And Dobby so, is a big one. Yes. Peter Pettigrew happens first and Peter Pettigrew dies uh, 
for the sake of redemption. Um, that is kind of like what his death stands for. So we have the start of the war, loss of innocence and redemption um, in the moments of his weakness where he sees who Harry is and he and Harry and Ron are pleading with him to let them out. He has a moment. He makes a decision to help them. And then the thing that he sacrificed everything for the the hand that he got back, the prestige that he made amongst the Death Eaters uh, ends up killing him so this hand that he was gifted by Voldemort as a reward for sacrificing his own hand to bring to resurrect Voldemort uh ends up strangling him so he ends up being like the thing that he sacrificed in his own betrayal ends up killing him when he decides to come back uh and it's like it's brutal it's a long um it's like a punishment sort of thing uh, of like, oh, finally your actions have caught up with you as you face the reality of what you've done. And now you're dead. Yep. And then we have probably the one that everyone remembers the most and is the most sad about, which is Dobby's passing. So Bellatrix essentially kills Dobby as they are escaping. So once they have apparated away, they realize that the Dobby that's with them is actually just Dobby's body. And yeah. uh and the this is the first of the deaths that they really get a chance to the characters get a chance to go through a mourning process and they actually get a chance to to bury him. Of course, this has ramifications on their relationship with Griphook and then them in, you know, infiltrating Gringotts. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um but this is the death that probably if you're thinking of Harry Potter deaths, like this is the one that most likely comes to mind is Dobby's death because it's so impactful both in the book and in the movies. Well, um, I love I, I, I think it's a beautiful. I scene. love it. It's a beautiful death. I, it Not only does it have an impact on like how grip hook helps them, but it's also important like because Dobby's Dobby's death is the representation of sacrifice in mm-hmm. a war. Uh, that that there are lives who are willingly put on and die for the good and the greater good of others. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that sacrifice that Dobby makes is necessary for Harry to later call upon uh, as he basically faces the same choice of if I go, I will die. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And knowing that Dobby did the same thing for him. It's incredibly, I think it's, it's one of the like most heart wrenching scenes. I think the, the only other time that I have felt sad as emotional uh, reading a Harry Potter book is uh, Sirius's death. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that there's something so cool about comparing the two deaths because Harry is confused with Sirius's death. Harry knows exactly what happened with Dobby's. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he's faced death is, enough. He understands it. That's gut. That's gut wrenching. That's like yeah. terrifying. He was terrified with like it, it's. It really shows his growth with death mm-hmm. and the comfortability he has with it. Um, because you know there there is like that sense of like you could almost sit there and say that like he was through the stages of grief with all the deaths. So you know he's in uh he's terrified and in pain with uh with Cedric's he's angry with Sirius's he's bargaining with Dumbledore's he's depressed with Hedwig's and then he is just like acceptance and deep like how can I make sure this never happens again with Dobby I love that I love that Ugh, it's just it's it's so it's so like heart-wrenching what happens to him um, and, um, and this is basically the end of the first movie for a reason. So we're gonna put a pin in that. Mm-hmm. Um, the next death that we, that we face, I'm pretty sure, cause these happen like in such quick succession. So please correct me if I'm wrong, Landon. I think it's Snape next. And then we get to Fred. Fred. Okay. So it's, okay. So it's Fred. So it's Fred, next. Snape. Yeah. It's Fred, Sna- it's Fred, Snape, Tongs, Remus. Yeah. Okay. So Fred comes next and, oh. um, this is one of those ones that's kind of like uh, you if you read a lot of books, you see it coming. But it's because 
it affects Ron so deeply. Um, this is another one that's pretty gut wrenching too, where I am almost remiss that I, I wish we could have spent more time on it because it like leads to other deaths that we don't get to we don't get to sit with it very much, just like we didn't get to sit with Hedwig's for very much. And um, and I'm almost sad about that. And I and I see I kind of see this in the fandom when it comes to to the deaths. Fred's the ones that, that gets talked about so much. Fred is the one that if you say it to people, it gets the biggest reaction, even if it's not the first one that you think of. Um, and I think that's because we don't get an opportunity to really grieve him very much in this book. Yeah, no. Um, and I think that that's the point of it. Yeah. Right. Like he is the death of a soldier. Yeah. He is the person who took on the responsibility, who took on everything. He was at the forefront of fighting and he is the, he is the casualty of a soldier. And that's like, that's the reality of war. Like, again, these are all representation of, of deaths that exist within war. So like, that's, that's one of them of like, you don't get to sit with that. It is in the middle of a battle. Spells are flying around. You don't know who actually killed him. Like, there's a fandom theory that it's that it's Bella, but we don't know. We that's don't just, know. That's just what the fandom likes to think. There's no evidence of the, who the fa- and the fandom him. likes to think Hi, that Kaneko, because by the way, hi. <laughs> fandom likes to think that because of the satisfaction of Molly Weasley killing Bellatrix. Yeah. So like, there's like a closure there, but that that's not. Spells are flying everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and he dies mid laugh, mid joke. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the truth uh, is, is like Molly picks Bellatrix as someone as the Death Eater to take her anger out on. But there's no evidence that she necessarily like 100 percent believes that Bellatrix mm-hmm. is who killed Fred. She's just she's just choosing that because she has to well, choose something <laughs> to. And she's to, also uh, defending Ginny okay about it. Yes. Yeah, she's also defending Ginny that Ginny yeah. is Ginny is. Uh, she has already lost Fred. She knows that she has lost Fred, and, and Ginny is facing Ginny someone who's going to kill her. She's gonna. She's mama bears it, right? Yeah. Like she can't, she's going to take it out on her. But there's no, there is no evidence in the books of who kills Fred. It is never mentioned, um, and that's because I mean, it, that's... it could be anything. Like it could even be friendly fire, and that would be like, and mm-hmm. and that that could have happened. Like based on what we have in the books, we have no idea. We have no idea. Um, and that is like, a that's the reality. And because of the way that it dies, where that he, di- he dies and the purpose of his death and what it's supposed to reflect, we don't get the privilege of sitting on it. We have this mm-hmm. beautiful scene with Dobby that we spend an entire chapter on. Uh, and then we go right to Fred, which is a paragraph because that's all mm-hmm. we can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's- then Harry has to go carry out the rest of the mission. Like he has, yeah, he has to it's, go. it's mid-war. There, it, he's yeah. a soldier. He's a soldier who fell, but it can't happen. Uh, and we'll see that again. I mean, I'm, I we can skip because it's in the same battle. Tonks and Remus die in that same exact moment. Like we don't yeah, know we don't, when they we don't die. Know, we don't know it, right? We can't. We find out later. We, we find out later. It's a line. Again, we don't get to sit with it. We don't get to mourn them. Yeah, uh, and I will tell you also. This is this is like how quick it goes so the version of um this movie the movie version that you can find online right now is on peacock and it's a tv edited version where they've they've shortened it slightly like it's not that shortened but this shot this screenshot i've got here is actually not in that tv edited version because it's literally like boom boom like it just goes right by and so if you're going to edit out things for time it's a very easy thing to edit out um and uh, and yeah i had to actually go hunting for a different version to take this screenshot because it was not in it's not in the version that's online right now yeah it's it's a in the book it is a line Mm -hmm. and in the movie it is a it is this that's yeah. it. You see them holding hands prior to the fight starting, and then you see this. Uh, and the reason that they died is not because their deaths represent anything. Uh, they leave behind an orphaned son. So they are the representation of the of the children who are lost in the war. Uh, and in a reflection of what Harry lost in the war, war prior, of that there is going to be a baby who is growing up in this world without its parents. Um. And that parent and that and but it happens in the same chaotic fighting. Uh, we don't find out until later, but it happens in this moment. Like so, there is deaths upon deaths. We also 
also see lavender like in the in the movies we see lavender brown die we see several other members die we see several death eaters die bellatrix being one of them um there's a lot of death and chaos that is existing in this moment uh and there are a huge amount of casualties but those are the those are the three that are really important in that moment that represent something and then there is one last major death in this book which of course well, is two. Severus well yeah too but there's Severus Snape <laughs> oh, we're we're not talking about Harry's death we're not talking about Harry's but I, but I characters. think it's important to talk about it's true that's true but <laughs> we'll talk about is, it in a second yeah there is one last um uh, you know other character death in this book which is Severus Snape and this is this death basically gives Harry the tools that he needs to understand um, why Snape has done the things that Snape has done. It gives Harry tools to understand his mother on a level that he's not had access to before. Because remember, everybody that Harry knows was James's friend from school. He doesn't know anything about his mom except that Other- everyone thinks that he looks a lot like her because of his eyes. And, and so Slughorn. Yeah, and Slughorn. Slughorn tells him a little bit, but really not much. We the, don't know. The way a, a the way a man can talk about his favorite student. There's a difference, yeah. but the the intimacy that exists. Yeah. Whereas now we get to see like a relationship that Lily had with someone who was her best friend for several mm-hmm. years, and um, so this is one of those like super plot relevant deaths because. I don't know, other than like introducing brand new characters that don't exist in these books, um, I don't know how else Harry could have really learned much about Lily and what she really stood for yeah. and what she represented and who she was and like what traits of hers he had within him, right? Um, so this is one of those deaths that that uh, that's very, very sad, you know, for me as a Snape fan, but no, also it's, is very plot relevant and very good. It's very sad. It's the martyr idea yeah. of like this is the person who had to die in order for the thing to happen yeah. Snape had to because Snape there was no world in which Snape I don't think there is any world in which Snape was capable of filling out the orders of giving Harry this information no, without him no dying way. Snape would have waited he didn't want Harry to be a pig for slaughter he didn't want that to happen to Lily's son I think he also was stubborn and would have like been like there is no time to do it so this is the only time and the only way and so in order to like push Harry forward Snape had to die yeah uh and that was a huge one a huge death uh he get he was able to access not only the memories of like this is Dumbledore's mission but also the information of Lily and who Lily was to Snape and the and like the memories of Lily growing up and being able to connect to her in that way absolutely and then I do want to talk about this death because I think it's important and we haven't really talked about it and that's Harry's death the savior that he died Harry Harry does a Jesus he he goes Harry does does a Jesus. Jesus He sacrifices himself. He he dies, and he is given the opportunity to come back. Um, but there is like that moment of like that. That's an important death moment of I am owning up to my responsibility and and being the pig for slaughter that I am, and I am going to die. And then switcheroo turns out the Horcrux inside of you is dead, and now you can come back to life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You can but come back without all of all of the pain. So you can live a pain-free pain. life for the rest of your life. And now you can save everyone else around you. Yes. Uh, but no, an important death nonetheless. Yes, for sure. So. Okay. The moment you have all been waiting for. It's time you, to talk about <laughs> this. Go ahead. Did you spot the problems? Did you, you spot, spot the problems in this book? Because we did. We spotted the problems. Okay, there's a few, you guys. There's a few. So many. <laughs> um, as a writer, I really dislike the Horcrux is dead, but the vessel is alive thing. It would have only made sense if the Horcrux and Harry had been set up as separate entities. True, but that would have required planning, which J.K. Yeah, Rowling yeah. lies about that she doesn't actually do. I don't know. I like it, but I like a good Jesus trope. Okay, I was raised on the Chronicles of Narnia. And, uh, Jesus is the main um, character. That's just I how it is. Like, I like the... Uh, I actually like the headcanon that the reason why Harry came back was not because of the Horcrux. It was because he was master of death. 
Yeah, I like that too. I like that too. That when, he, when Fix do he that, in I'm that like, moment, yes. he in that moment owned all of the Horcruxes. They all swore fealty and loyalty to him, and he did master death. That was my has always been my interpretation, and will always be my interpretation. It had nothing to do with Horcruxes and everything to do with being master of death. Yeah, I think that's that's cool. When Fix do that for Harry, I think that's really cool. But anyway, okay, favorite. spot the problem. Spot the problems. Okay, yes. we've got a few. We've got a few, and we're gonna start out with um one that is really. Not to do with the book. It's about the book versus the movie. Okay. So you guys know our opinions on taking something and splitting it into two movies, like taking a, a book or whatever and splitting it into two movies or or like doing the doing the two movie thing and then you release them a year later. Okay. We have an episode on The Matrix where we talk all about this as a concept. So I want to talk about a couple of things that the act of splitting the final book into two movies did for the Deathly hallows um because it's not good okay it's not good this should have been one movie okay this should have been one movie there's no reason to split it so yeah yes let's get into it so when you are watching the movies the first movie ends on dobby's death which is great it is a very heavy part of the book it is a great conclusion to the first movie. It makes you like want to watch the second one. I understand that. But what that caused is for everyone to have the interpretation. This happened to me too because it's been a while since I had re- went and reread this book. For everyone to have the interpretation that all they do in this book is run around in the woods and be boring. That's not true. Okay, that's the movie. The movie did that. In the movie, they run around in the woods and be boring. In the book, stuff happens every single freaking chapter. Okay, but in the movie, they run around and be boring in the woods. And then, because that is the first movie, then the second movie, you get a lot of drawn out bits in regards to the final battle, which is cool. However, all it makes you feel is like, wait a second, why weren't we kept up to date on what was going on at Hogwarts in the first movie? So you end up with two movies that could have been better if they had just like made it one movie. Like there's so much that you could have cut and still kept the plot together and made a good movie version of this to where splitting them was not necessary. It just wasn't. Okay. So yeah, it didn't need to be split. Period. They did it for money. That's it. Go watch the Matrix episode if you want a full breakdown of why studios have done this so many times. I think the only time that they did it successfully is uh, Hunger Games. And we can talk about that at a later date. But yes. with this one, no point. Yeah, no, no point. point. Absolutely no, no point, freaking no. point. No point. Okay, what is what is it? What is it? The movie also mess up. The movie also messes up Ron's growth. Okay, let's talk about this. This is a pet a pet problem of mine. So Ron's story is he is the youngest son of tons of siblings. Okay, and so all of his life he is also like he's, successful. Siblings. Yeah, super. Like, successful. That's an important part. Yes. So he is always playing second fiddle. Right. He's playing second fiddle in his home life. He he his best friend is famous. He's playing second fiddle there. He's kind of just OK at school. He's not really super academic. So he's second fiddle to uh, to his crush. Right. Hermione, he's second fiddle all of his life. Right. So in the book, what that means is when he wears the Horcrux, um, he is worried that his friends are leaving him behind. And then in the movie, they decide to add this romantic undertone to it, which is totally not necessary and has nothing to do with Ron as a character. There is no reason for Ron to think that Hermione is romantically interested in Harry. Okay, there is no reason. It doesn't happen in the book. But in the movie, the visual language of the movie that we are shown from Ron's perspective is that is what we, we come to conclude that he's really upset about is not being second fiddle to his smarter, more capable, more interesting friends, but instead that his crush likes his best friend instead of him. That's the impression that you're left with. And it doesn't have anything to do with Ron. And, it, and it, it, it's not good. It's not good. It is important to note that there is parts of the book where where uh, Ron does like accuse Hermione of choosing Harry over him, but it's not in a romantic sense. It's platonic. It's in the it's in the sense of like you guys are moving on without me. Yeah, he's like I am I of hate no that you're, use here. Yes, he's like I hate that you're smarter than me. I hate that you're stronger than me. I hate that you're faster than me. Like that's why he's that's why and he's that mad they, at Hermione and accusing her of that. 
and that they can handle it. Like that's yes. the other thing too that is happening here is that they're able to handle it. Like he can't handle being hungry. He can't handle being out on his own. They have had to suffer the trauma and push through it before. Harry has had like has been hungry, has been out on his own. Hermione has always been forced to be resourceful and has always felt like her life is at danger. Ron has never had to do that. So they are naturally good and have the coping mechanisms and he doesn't. And he feels like he sucks at that. But the movie is just like, no, it's because he definitely thinks Harry and Hermione want to be alone because they want to get it on, which is so stupid and does a disservice to not only the relationship between Harry and Ron, which has been the most important relationship throughout this entire series, but also does a huge disservice to the Ron and Hermione ship. Yeah. (laughs) And it's just it's just not and it's something that Ron would ever actually think. It's just not. Like, Ron would never think that because that's not what he's focused on. That's not what he cares about. That's not I what think, pains him. I think he, Ron doesn't have happens. problems getting girls, okay? Like, let's be clear. Yeah. Ron doesn't have problems getting girls. This has never been a problem for him throughout the books. No. When we see drama in regards to to him and girls, it's when they go to the 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 ball, right? Mm-hmm. And he is sad that he's having this, this date um, that's not the date he wanted. But, like, his date wants him, okay? Like, she wants to have fun with him. She thinks that taking him is a good idea. Like, he doesn't have problems with girls. He just doesn't. This is not a no. thought that would occur to Ron. They, I think that's, like, the biggest disservice that they've done to Ron's character. Like, they yes. do a lot of disservice and a lot of dirty in Ron Ron's character in the movie. And that's making him the dorky best friend. He's not. He's the hot jock best friend. Yeah. Girls are giggling about him. Girls want to hang out with him. There's a reason why he can pull Lavender Brown. There's a reason why she goes crazy psycho clingy. He's a hot Quidditch star who, like, has a lot of, like, the puppy dog sort of, like, aspects to his personality. Yes. He's incredibly charming. He comes from a big fucking family. He is, like, he he's a great guy. There is no issue there. And yeah. Hermione has also been crushing on him at this point for two books. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, like, he knows that, too. And he, like, he's only just starting to accept it this book. He is starting to, like, and it's not even accepting that Hermione likes him. It's, like, how can I be the man she deserves? Mm-hmm. Because it is, again, down to his feelings of that he doesn't deserve it. He feels That's inadequate. why he... That's why he reads this fucking book about like how to how to charm a witch in 10 yeah. ways to charm a witch or whatever and starts doing that shit is because he feels inadequate. He doesn't know how to express that he likes her. And yeah. it has nothing to do with the fact that she likes Harry. No, or it's he, he wants to be that. good enough. He wants to be good enough for Hermione. That's what and it's it about. Makes me so angry. Like the the book versus movie makes me so angry on a lot of things with these two. Yeah, it's pretty bad. And then it's pretty bad. And then um, in the movie version, this is the, the reason this is... why. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you go. Never mind. Okay. So in the movie version, the reason why the Slytherins are not at the battle is because the teachers order them to be locked up. Okay, so let me just let me just recap what happens during this little moment right here. Okay, so the Slytherin girl, um, what the fuck is her name? Pansy Pat- Pansy, Pansy Parkinson. Pansy. Pansy Parkinson's is like Harry's right there. Just hand him over. Are you people stupid? This happens in both the book and the movie. Okay, and the teachers, mostly McGonagall's which, reaction to this. Yeah, so so go ahead. I was gonna say, which by the way, reasonable. She's a seventeen-year-old yes. girl who's facing the death and destruction of the only home that she has known, and there is a boy there who could stop all this from happening. Why the fuck you wouldn't like the fact that she's villainized for this? I don't know if you've been hanging around seventeen-year-olds recently, but I don't know a single seventeen-year-old who wouldn't do this. Yeah, I mean, every, all, they, they were all thinking it. Okay, she was just yeah, she at least said it. it. She's okay. brave to say it. <laughs> so, so basically, the the teacher's reaction to this, mostly McGonagall in the movie is to say lock up all the Slytherins okay because Pansy is a bitch and opened her mouth to say something a bunch of the students were already thinking you're going to lock them all up no a teacher with McGonagall's like um you know experience and age would not that would not be her reaction it's so lock, dumb lock up the children in the dungeons we're talking children we're not talking necessarily just 18 and 19 yeah. year olds we're Seven talking 11 11 year olds we're going to go downstairs and lock up the children in a dungeon where a war is happening and there's no way that they have the power or ability to escape and leave. Mm-mm. 
what the fuck and i know i know that this is supposed to be like a uh we hate slytherins slytherins are the bad guys you guys are all related to the blood terrorists like totally understand that like that's the purpose for it but they did mcgonagall dirty she would never do that this is me off because what the fuck this is such a stupid change such an unnecessary change that destroys everything so dumb yeah true Rara. the amount of childhood child abuse that happens at hogwarts is very concerning but yeah but in the books this is not what happens in the books all of the teachers are encouraged to help the students evacuate and all students yeah this is not like a <laughs> slytherin thing they're encouraged to help the students evacuate and the students that are 17 or older are told you can evacuate if you want go for it but you don't have to we don't control you you're of age but if you're under 17 like you really need to evacuate and the truth is is that when the slytherins evacuate they don't come back that's literally all that happens in the books. That's it. And why the fuck would they also, come back? It's their parents that they would be fighting. Also, some other children didn't come back either because they're children who don't need to be fighting in a war. <laughs> it's just it's so it's so stupid that the movie does this. It's, it's unnecessary. The Slytherins are already the bad guys. There's no reason to show the audience. By the way, remember the Slytherins are bad guys. Like that's unnecessary. Doesn't need to be said. We're not stupid. It's dumb. I hate this change. Hate it. It's so stupid. Yep. Okay. And then there's the biggest one. The the change that I, you probably knew we were gonna gonna talk. About I can write. Ago. I can write a fucking thesis on this on this change and how much it piece, pisses me off. Okay. The fucking butterflies. Okay, the butter. He dies in a cascade of flaky butterflies. This is not, this doesn't make any, in the book, it's actually really beautiful that he Mm. like dies as a man. And in the movie, that's what he he is. Butterfly explosion. Like, okay, this is, and this is all fault of the fact that it's a movie. This is all fault of that. The battle in the book is not a battle. The battle is done. You have a battle. Harry goes and sacrifices his life. They come back. They don't fight. They don't fight. People gather around to watch as Voldemort takes a victory speech because he thinks he's won. Harry falls out of Hagrid's arms, wakes back up, raises his wand, and gives this beautiful speech. This beautiful speech. Um, d- at this point, Nagini has ar- uh, Nag- Nagini has already been slain. Like it is this moment of like victory. No spells are cast. No one is running around anywhere. There's no stupid "we die together" bullshit. They are surrounded in the sun rising of the Great Hall, having a man to man moment. And Harry is like, "That wand is mine." You hold my wand. We're going to see who's going to win. They cast their spells and Voldemort dies as a man. And it's, it's something where like, I understand a movie is a visual medium, so they have to make certain changes and they have to make it visually appealing and mm -hmm. da, 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 da. They also had to elongate to get the hours, the hour and a half because they cut it into two movies. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't just have a big speech. They had in a very big dramatic moment, they had to have a five minute battle between the two in order to make it visually dynamic, but also to have the five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Dark Scarlet. Welcome in. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it looks like you are new here. So thank you so much Hi. for saying hello. Um, we're doing great. We're talking about we're talking about our favorite things, which is bitching about Harry Potter. So that's bitching what about today. Harry Potter. Spot <laughs> the problems. Yes, exactly, Rar. That's what I was building up to. There's so many ways to kill him in a visually pleasing manner without making him a bunch of butterflies. Exactly. Like I agree that you have to make certain well, changes. I agree of like the fact that they split it into two movies means they have to elongate the battle. And I do mm-hmm. like that the movie shows a lot more like beautifully choreographed wand fighting in the battle. Like, I think that's cool and a good addition. OK, like I'm not complaining about that, uh. but they didn't they could have still kept the same ending for Voldemort dying. Well, they didn't have to turn him into like a bunch of butterfly also, ashes. Like, Stupid. that's the whole point. We just spent two fucking movies hunting down the thing that made this man magical that made him something more than human we spent two movies on it and then they decided to 
have him disapparate into like he didn't no he died as a man he died he was as a, a man human. all the horcruxes were gone there was nothing it magical about him that's anymore. literally the whole point it's like it's it i whoever made this decision whatever team made this decision read the entire fucking series and missed the whole point yep this this makes me angrier than did you put your did you put your name in the goblet of fire this change is the worst thing this change ruined every single movie for me yeah i cannot watch the harry potter movies without thinking about this because the because it totally undermines the thesis of harry potter it totally undermines it which is that you cannot escape death that at the Mm -hmm. end of the day we are all still humans and we're all Mm -hmm. still going to die he is a human he is a human who did terrible things, did terrible things to his soul, did terrible things to the wizarding world, to other people. But at the end of the day, through thick and thin, through the power of love and friendship, <laughs> he died a man. Yeah. And turning him into a shit ton of butterfly and ashes does not make him die a man. Nope. Sorry, Rar. Yes, we're 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 here to we're here to ruin Harry Potter for you more. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, but you know what? That's not all. There's some other problems. There's some other problems um, in regards to this book that we would like to talk about, um, and that is the betrayal of Grip Hook. So just to make sure we're all caught this is up also on... another change in the in the movie. That's anyway, true, continue. but it's bad in the book too. Is bad. Oh, in the book. no, it's actually it's actually worse than the book. <laughs> It's one of the ones that it's worse in the book than in the movie. True. Oh, my God. Okay, so this is basically what happens. Um, they need the sword of Gryffindor, okay? Mm-hmm. They need to do they need to do this like little this little this little thing with the sword of Gryffindor, so they have to go in, um infiltrate Gringotts. Grip Hook is feeling kind of like friendly towards them because he sees that they had made a house elf friend. So he's like, huh. You have a house elf friend. You buried him. How that's cool. You know, I I I think you're you're cool for wizards. I'll help you out. But yeah. in return, I need you to return the sword of Gryffindor to Goblin Hood. Okay. And Griphook explains this to them. And then afterwards, Remus also explains that, right? Is Remus that has this conversation with him? Or maybe it's somebody else. But anyway. Yeah, it's either Bill or Remus. I think it's Bill. Uh, maybe it's Bill. Okay, so then Bill has this conversation with him. It's like, guys, just to make sure that you understand, goblins think differently in regards to ownership. Like, yes, that sword was forged for Godric Gryffindor and Godric Gryffindor owned it. But because to goblins, they do not believe in inheritance. They simply don't have the concept of inheritance. So what that means is that when Godric Gryffindor died, now the ownership goes back to goblin hood like goblins collectively now own it because it was goblin made and they don't believe in inheritance okay well, and also ki- ki- kind of in favor of this i kind of think goblins got the right idea to be i was quite actually honest. i was actually like this is the most progressive jk rowling has ever written because yeah. what she's really explaining because also we have heard for books and books and books about the goblin wars and there was a lot of tension between wizards and goblins and wizards came in and basically said you will work for us you will make our weapons and then we will use those weapons to disempower you and we will be your leaders uh basically what they did they they white supremacy all over goblins Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh and so they came in and did that so what grip hook is actually asking is just retribution is just or or, or just to like sit there and be like give something that was made by my people with my people's tools and magics back to me Back yeah. to our people. He's literally uh, just saying, like, it's not right for British people to have a bunch of Egyptian mummies in their museums. That's literally all he's saying. And he's right. He, But, like, the thing is that's so, like, just infuriating is that he, according to JKR, is in the wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So he is the he one is that is wrong. He's the one. Him, him trying to get his stuff back shouldn't actually happen, because no, it was made for wizards. Yeah, this is a wizard thing, and we show that there's never it never is said, but we know that because a he doesn't end up with the sword, or he does end up with the sword, but it's still stolen from him. No, like by... Harry, Harry and Hermione and Ron all trick him. No, but he ends up with the sword, but that's how it ends up in. in 
it, but it's still so he they trick him they go through this whole thing of conning him of planning on tricking him on planning on betraying him he still ends up with the sword but then chapters later neville's wearing the the sorting hat and the sword gets pulled out of it so it doesn't even Mm -hmm. matter if it's returned Mm -hmm. to the goblins Mm -hmm. they still don't get to keep it because it's Mm -hmm. not really theirs Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly yes it ends up back in the hat it ends up back how how fucking (sighs) british is that (laughs) it's and white supremacist it's, it's so, so stupid. It's and, so stupid. And once again, well, our three main characters do not care or sympathize with mm-mm. Rip Hook's situation at all. They literally like get together and are like, all right, so how can we trick him anyway? They don't so, care. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing that's like they in the books actively try to trick him. And Grip Hook just seems like a good guy who's trying to help him out, who's trying to get his stuff back for his people. Right. Yeah. Who's trying to get some recognition, who sees this man who is honorable and with his own hands, without magic, bury someone he, that wizarding kind considers lesser than him. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. Grip, Grip Hook thinks that they can he can trust him. Well, turns out that you can't. They end up just betraying him and planning on doing that. Mm-hmm. In the movie, they they tried to like make Grip Hook a terrible person. Uh, they really, they really <laughs> like amped up on the creepiness. They amped up on the brutality. They amped up on the like, you're not rooting for this guy. A lot of the stuff that was used in visual were used or anti-Semitic. Uh, the visual like language ideas. that they give to the grip hook yep. character in the movie is abysmal. Yes, and and goblins are already incredibly anti-Semitic in in the series. Like they're mm-hmm. bankers who are selfish and supposedly control all the money, right? Like the, they're already abysmal, but they make it even worse for grip hook. Yeah. Uh, they make it sound like he's going to betray them. Like there's a lot of. Uh, the movies tweaks it so it does not seem as bad, but it makes it worse in a different way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Grip Hook is a really cool name. I totally agree with you. Are <laughs> <It's a great name. laughs> yeah, but in the in the books, like n- there is no indication like that he's nothing but honest with his desires and what he is expecting from the trio. Like there is not any internal, even any internal narration from Harry. That's like, I don't think we should trust this guy. Like that doesn't happen. Right. But in the movie, the visual language that we're given is that he's kind of shifty. He's kind of shady. Like maybe we shouldn't trust him. Like, yeah, he's helping, but he's only going to help us for this. And then he's, and then he's, he's not, he doesn't care anymore. Like that's the visual language that we get in the movie with the the you know the makeup that he has with the way that the actor delivers the lines with the way that he is shot you know um we are inherently encouraged to not trust grip hook in the movie and that doesn't happen in the book in the book the kids are just cruel they're just cruel and they just try to betray him <laughs> that's that's it that's what happens <laughs> they're just yeah. terrible yeah. So uh, Grip Hook yeah. is one of those subplots that is just like, it just shows that really J.K. Rowling's only political ideology is that the status quo is good, actually, and we should never, ever do anything to to change anything about anything. Like, you know, that's that's her political ideology. And I feel like the Grip Hook subplot is one of the things yeah, that supports that. I, it's always it's always a moral conundrum. To like be like, oh, I'm going to support the Antifa wizards while they're actively being fascists against other things. <laughs> <laughs> while they're actively <gasps> denying denying the history and property and and like <laughs> dispowering uh, uh, goblins and owning slaves mm-hmm, and they're mm-hmm. actively doing all of these mm-hmm. things. But I'm a I have to support. That side, I guess maybe we could burn it down. The whole thing. Oh my god. Yeah. Thing. So if that if that sentence interests you, you need to go on my YouTube channel and and find the, the <laughs> video called There's a lot of cops in the Harry Potter Antifa, where we actually do a deep dive into the Order of the Phoenix. And like there's a lot of cops in the Harry Potter Antifa. So many there? cops. That's so many so many cops in, in the Harry Potter Antifa. <laughs> it's almost so, like yeah. they're not the good guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's almost like there are no good guys in Harry Potter. There's literally just the fascists and the liberals, and there's nobody else. No one else exists in Harry mm. Potter. <laughs> it's truly depressing at this point. Okay. So All right. 
Last but not least of the problems is the freaking epilogue. Okay. The freaking Speaking of cops. Epilogue. Speaking of cops. Yes. Um, Harry Harry's pain is taken away. He's no longer a Horcrux anymore. And so then he can pursue the the best um profession ever, becoming a listen, wizard cop. I have the mm. words all was well written on my uh written on my body. I am perfectly content with having an epilogue. This is not the epilogue I wanted. Mm-hmm. Uh, first mm-hmm. of all, Ginny deserves better. Love her. Love Ginny. Stan Ginny. She didn't get to name any of her children. And that's <laughs> truly depressing. Uh, second of all, you, you all heard, hopefully, last week, my issue with the names of Albus fucking Severus. <laughs> uh it's terrible terrible name uh ron and ron deserves better uh then i his story it depends on how fan fiction plays it but currently where he's at just working on wizard wizard weasley wizard wheezes no and harry's a fucking cop (laughs) okay wait wait a second wait a second Rar, this comment is so funny to me. Why does Jenny look like the most Karen of Karens in that screenshot? Because you know what? In the mid-2000s, because in the mid-2000s, that wasn't a Karen haircut. That was just the haircut we all had. Girl, I had this haircut at the same time. I'm just, we just didn't, because, because Karens weren't a thing then, okay? This is is Karen hate. (laughs) We also have to remember that this is movie Jenny, book Jenny, so much better. But this is movie Jenny that we have a screenshot of. And the epilogue. Had her being a stay-at-home wife to a cop. I'm sorry, but the epilogue, Ginny, is a Karen. Why? She she asks to speak to your manager <laughs> because she's so miserable with her mediocre husband and her no actual goals for herself, even though she should have been a Quidditch star and actually way cooler than any of them. <laughs> The epilogue didn't give her that. The epilogue did her fucking dirty. The, <laughs> the epilogue is why I read fan fiction. That is why 12 years later, I am still reading fan fiction. This is violence. I'm dead. I've been killed. I'm going to cry all my makeup off. I can't believe this. <laughs> no, it's true, though. It's true, though. Yeah, I had that haircut. Um, you know, Rara, I'm not surprised your mom also had I that haircut. I did, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The epilogue does not exist. Yes, we pretend it does not exist, and it's so We'd funny. Like to okay. think in the movie, in the movie, the epilogue is so funny because it's all the same exact actors with just bad makeup on to make them look older. Like I mean, and terrible look at how, hair. Look at how look at Ron. Okay, like look at Ron. Oh wait, y'all can't see him because I'm blocking it. Hang on, let me move my face. Once, give me one second, you guys. Let me move my face for a second. Okay, look at this. They put Ron in some pants that straight up just didn't fit. Like, look at this. Just to make him look older with a pudgy belly. Like, look at that. What the heck? <laughs> give him also, my face like, back. he's not in this screenshot, but Draco Malfoy is balding. Yes. They, like, put a, they put like a hair cap on him so he could have a receding hairline. Like, it looks is, ridiculous. This is violence. Are you kidding me? The man whose father has a full, could be a Pantene commercial head of hair. Are you telling me that 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 this man bald? No, this is violence against Draco Malfoy. <laughs> I see you, and I know that you hate Slytherins. <laughs> oh my God, it's so true. You're right. Draco would never be balding. When you look at Lucian, the heck? and also like all of Narcissus. Like, sure, the mother you inherit the mother's gene. I'm sorry. They and Narcissa all has amazing hair have- too. Also, look at her sisters. Like Bellatrix has the most amazing, beautiful like full curls i've ever seen like no way draco is like, not literally balding. he would not be balding there's no way that is violence against that's violence against draco malfoy so the rest deserve is. nothing including hair <laughs> except kingsley <laughs> oh my god you're too you're cracking me up you're cracking me up but yeah this epilogue's garbage it shouldn't exist um you know we didn't need an epilogue okay like i really didn't need. no we to did know. i'm okay with one <laughs> yeah i don't think we, I, we just one. deserved a better one I just I just feel like, you know, because this is the truth, though, is that there is no other epilogue that J.K. Rowling could have written because for her life, yes. the, the, the best because this epilogue is like your happy ending. Right. Yes. And the best thing in life. 
for J.K. Rowling is to be happily married with lots of children. We know this. We know she has a lot of pain from her first husband and that a lot of her healing has happened because of her remarriage. Like she has talked about this at length. We Mm -hmm. know it. And being a mom is very, very important to her. No shade, by the way, if that is your path to happiness in life. I am I am I here it. for you, okay? Feminism means you can do whatever the fuck you want. And she can do whatever the fuck she wants in regards to how she lives her life in, in that way. And and so, like, I'm happy to have, like, okay, maybe that's the path that Harry and Ginny go on, okay? But why does every single character go on that same path? This is not the path to happiness for everybody. There's no variety here. And that's why this epilogue is painful because everybody takes the exact same steps in life. And that is just yeah. not how life goes. Okay. No, it's just it not. not. Also, like, to put it into context, Harry's supposed to be 34 years old here. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. Look at that he's baby face 34 to be year old. 34. He looks like he's either 18 or 70. I don't know which one. <laughs> 34 years old this man is supposed to be 34 years old he looks like a balding 50 year old oh wait koneko that's a great idea okay koneko says i just thought of that and honestly we should have gotten a marriage epilogue it would work so well Um, imagine the epilogue being like harry and and jenny going to ron and hermione's wedding imagine that'd be amazing so i would be down I am I am a fan of the epilogue because there's so much suffering. I feel like we do need a reassurance that after the war, the world is healed, yes. right? Like, I think that is a necessary part of the narrative. 17 years later is ridiculous. The only good thing that came out of this epilogue was uh, was Teddy and Victoire, which is one of my OTPs. They have four lines in total, and I ship it so hard. Anyway... <laughs> Yeah, it should have been Ron and Hermione getting married exactly. And then a conversation comes up that a former classmate is expecting exactly Koneko. Like, come on. Absolutely. And that would have satisfied that would have satisfied not only J.K. Rowling's need for everyone to get married and yes. have children, but it wouldn't have well, been like such a slap in the face and so samey looking that all the characters and here's did the, the deal. same thing. Even at that point, I would have been okay with Harry going into the Aurors. Wouldn't have liked it, would have fought against it, would have been like, it still fights that same thing. But that makes sense. He would still have been, he would still have been 21 without much healing happening. Like, that makes sense. Yeah. At this point, he's head of the orders. He's been in for 17 years. Yeah, that's like, mm-hmm. that's like too far. Like, no, I'm sorry, but Harry would have been a teacher at this point. Like, realistically, mm-hmm. Harry would have been a teacher. He would have realized that the orders weren't from him, that he didn't like following rules, that he doesn't like the chain of command, that he doesn't trust other people, that he 100% would have been a teacher. Like, yeah, you could have Ginny in there. You could have a Ginny Harry sort of thing in this this Ron and Hermione epilogue where she's like going out and being a Quidditch player. Like you could have had those great moments, and instead we got seventeen years later. Later, yeah, it's not necessary. Yeah, Harry can have a midlife crisis later, realizing the cops are bad. I think that's actually quite realistic for his character. I think that's what he would have done, and would still fit ideologically into a story that's supposed to be about defeating fascism. Right? That Harry becomes a cop. He's, he's a cop for a couple of years and then is just like, this is not for me. I, I think that's I, I see, absolutely. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I see now how the system works and I disagree with it. Like that makes a lot of sense because it actually matches with his character. And and I know this because you can find on TikTok very easily ex-cops talking about their experiences being cops. And that matches Harry a lot to me. Like the way that yeah. those guys talk, that's it's, that matches a lot. To and me. also like the boy, the boy was raised to fight evil Mm -hmm. and do good and is told that's what the Aurors do. And like, that's the only thing that's been told in his head that he can do when he starts doing healing. And when he realizes that Aurors is not about doing what he has been doing his whole life, it's a completely different thing. He'd a hundred percent realize that this is not for him. Oh my God. You guys, Landon, our, our chat is so smart. We have the we have the Is smartest it? chat, you guys. Like, look we at, do have the smartest. We chat. have the we have the smartest and best chat on Twitch. I swear to God. Like, you know, it's we are so small, smart. but we are mighty. <laughs> small but mighty. Yes. So. Yes. I I like this epilogue we just wrote way better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hit me Thank up you, on Koneko Ao3. And, and Rar and, and Dark Scarlet. <laughs> Y'all, I'm gonna need you to go on to Ao3. I'm gonna need mm-hmm. you to write it, mm-hmm. and then we'll mm-hmm. submit it to something. And that's mm-hmm. that's. I'll just tear the epilogue out of my book and I'll and just insert paste the pages. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I mm-hmm. have copies at my in my classroom. I'll do the same thing there so that every future generation that reads my Harry Potter books will think <laughs> that that's how it ended all along. Oh, that would have been so much better. It would have it would have satisfied everybody and it would have been so much better. It would have been so much better. So much better. All right. Anyway. We all are right, over time, so we should we should wrap this up. We're going to wrap it up. Yes, we're going to wrap it up. Okay, where can you find us? Well, you can find us right here on Saturdays from about noon to about two-ish. Um, next week, we are having a uh, Harry Potter fandom episode. Every couple of Harry Potter episodes, we like to do one of these. And um, you know what? Uh, I'm gay. You're gay. Harry's gay. Everybody's gay. We're going to talk about queering Harry Potter, okay? There is a huge queer fandom for Harry Potter. And we are going to talk about where that comes from, why that's here, and why we feel like that is important to us as uh, people that have been in the Harry Potter fandom since forever. Okay. Yes. So don't miss that. Come back. Come back noon next week. Yes. I love that. Yes. Gay, gay hard hands. Koneko. There we go. Yes. Um, also, I stream on Sundays. Artistic license that also starts at noon. Uh, we are doing a hundred percent run through of Final Fantasy X right now, and we're gonna beat Yojimbo five times in a row. Dark Yojimbo. That's where we are. We're gonna we're gonna beat him up five times because because it, it takes five times. You have to beat him up five times in a row. Can you tell I'm not looking forward to it? I can't believe you have to beat him up five times in a row. But anyway, we're gonna try to do that tomorrow. So come on back if you would like to see that. Um, also, you can find all of my VODs on YouTube. I've got them organized into playlists. It's very fun. Put those on uh, while you do your house chores. Um, it's a good time. What did this guy do to you? He made me beat him up five times, Rar. I just explained it. My gosh. <laughs> Hopefully I can beat him. We'll find out. He's one of the hardest bosses in the game. We're going to beat Dark Yojimbo up five times. Okay. Um, yeah, you can find all my VODs on YouTube. You can do all of those things. Uh, socials, I'm putting them in the chat. Why do you want to follow my socials? You want to follow my Twitter, um, at least now until Elon kills it. Um, <laughs> because that's where all the updates are. So if there's ever any changes or delays in streams, you can find it on Twitter. Also, you want to join uh, my Discord. Or on Discord. <laughs> yeah. You also want to join my Discord because um, Discord's not dying, for one. For two... I control the notifications in there. So if you want to make sure you get notifications for every time I post a YouTube video, every time um, we go live on stream, you want to be in the Discord because I will actually make sure those go out to you guys. Um, So yeah, if you would like to support me, here's all of the ways. Um, You can subscribe right here on Twitch. We have a merch shop. Please check it out. I'm I'm practicing making slime. I might put some of those in in the merch shop. Um, We've got we've got right here some we've got some Gryffindor slime. Okay, right Ooh. here. It's a, it's a very shiny, it's a very shiny, glossy slime. Okay, and it's cinnamon scented. See that shine? Ooh, very shiny. Right, very, okay, very we shiny. Talking, yeah, we were talking about how much Hufflepuffs like um like food. I I made a Hufflepuff butter slime that smells like um like pancakes. Okay, so it's very soft, buttery, and it smells like pancakes. Okay. Anyway, but you can find stickers and, and clothing and stuff in the merch shop. Um, also, you can donate. I've got the tips. I've got a wish list. You know, all the things, all the things like you're used to seeing. So that's all. That's where you can find me. Landon, where can everybody find you? You can find me at Land in Maine on Instagram and Twitter, as long as it's not a, it's still around as of tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm also here most most Saturdays and um. Yeah, I have a book out and I am always accepting donations. I am a sixth grade teacher and uh, my school has recently passed a policy where it will no longer provide uh, classroom books for us, which means that if I want kids to be educated and have access to books uh, that represent them and the kids I have in my classroom, I need to provide them myself. So I have an Amazon wish list for all of the books that I hope to have my kids have access to uh, in my Instagram bio. So if you are and able please feel free to check that out. If not, no big deal. I am just here to entertain you and talk about all things all the time. Yes, for sure. Um, If you guys are able to help out Landon with her her books, um, we would very much appreciate that. All right, you guys, let's find someone to raid. Uh, I am checking who is live. Let's see. Okay. We're going to go ahead and raid um, Yaleys. Uh, they are part of that raid train we're going to do in in January. And they're playing Breath of the Wild right now. And their stream looks really cute. So that's Ooh. who we're going to raid. Um, yeah, they got like this really pretty, beautiful like little border. Let me see if I can spell this person's name right. Um, did I do it right? 
Yes. Okay. There. Oh, you're part of the raid train too. Okay. Awesome. Dark Scarlet. Thank you so much. I will go check you out as well. Let's go. Um, so we will do that. Okay. So we're going to go raid Yaleys. Thank you guys so much for watching. And uh, don't forget, of course, as always, to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. See y'all tomorrow. Bye. Bye.